Welcome to War of the Realms, the full story. You see, here at Comic Story, and we bring you your various comic books, video games, and movies broken down into a synopsis and or audio drama. And today, we're going to bring you our full playlist for the War of the Realms. Now, the War of the Realms is an entire event built up in Marvel in which Thor lost his worthiness and then became worthy again, while Jane Foster became Thor in the Intermediate. And then, basically, the War of the Realms happened behind all of that, coming to this point. So today's video is going to give you a synopsis of the three years before the War of the Realms, giving you a quick what you need to know guide, and then we're gonna kick off with War of the Realms. But we did this a little bit differently here. We did issue one, we did issue two, we did issue three, we did issue four, we did issue five, we did issue six, but we did all of the tie-ins in the middle, and we have spliced them into the story in between these things. So what I'm getting at is this is the full War of the Realms plus tie-ins where we think they belong in the storyline plus the synopsis leading up to this point. So if you're ready to see the story of how Thor became worthy again, stick around because it's starting right now. What are the Ten Realms? The Ten Realms make up the world tree in Norse mythology and are considered different planes of reality or planets. It gets a little hazy the way Marvel does it in the Marvel Universe. Each realm is generally home to different creatures of myth from the Norse myths. They are as follows. Midgard. This is Earth, home to the humans and the mightiest heroes around. This is the last realm to be attacked during the war, and now that the war has come, it is up to the many heroes of Earth to defend it and take back the other realms. Asgard. Once home to the gods, Asgard was actually destroyed at the end of Jason Aaron's Mighty Thor run, when it was attacked by Mangok. Meliketh realized that the Asgardians were the only ones capable of stopping him, and he released a Mangog against them. While Jane Foster Thor sacrificed herself, don't worry, she's okay, to defeat Mangog, the city was destroyed and the Asgardians were forced to relocate to Earth. The Bifrost, which is the Asgardians' way to travel to other realms, was also destroyed, thus making it impossible for Thor to fight against Meliketh and his forces. Here's where the name butchering's gonna start. Svartalheim, home of the Dark Elves and the birthplace of Meliketh. You will get to him in a minute. Jotunheim, home of the Frost Giants and the birthplace of Loki, the adopted brother of Thor. Elfheim, the home of the Light Elves. Vanaheim, home of such heroes as Hogan, Sif, and Heimdall. Nidavell, home of the Doors. Niflheim, realm of the dead. Musvalheim, home of the fire demons and heaven. The recently discovered 10th realm is the place of warrior angels that have also sided with Meliketh in his war. This realm was actually introduced by Jason Aaron during his Thor run and was shown to be the home of Angela, the long lost daughter of Odin and sister to Thor and Loki. When it was believed that the angels had killed his daughter, Odin actually severed it from the world tree and erased all knowledge of heaven from history. Okay, so we just said a bunch of weird names and hopefully Dylan put them on the screen so you can see how they're actually spelled and this may have confused people. We apologize, let's move on. Who is Meliketh? Now, the War of the Realms was started by the Dark Elf Meliketh. Meliketh was originally created by Walt Simonson and first appeared in Thor number 344 in 1984. He is a powerful sorcerer who has plagued Thor throughout his history and was eventually locked up in the Realm of the Dead. That is until Thor God of Thunder number 13 by Jason Aaron, when the evil being was freed from his prison. Thor, working alongside warriors from the other realms, tried to stop Meliketh and end his reign of terror. Yet despite his best efforts, Meliketh was able to walk free due to his political schemings. This allowed him to conquer his home world. Then he set his sights on the entirety of the Ten Realms, and quickly began to ally himself with the Frost Giants and the Fire Demons. Further allies would appear in the form of Dario Agar, head of Roxxon Corporation on Earth, who has sided with Meliketh due to the financial gain of war for his company, as well as the Enchantress and Loki, who as always seems to be playing both sides against each other. The war began across all ten realms in Mighty Thor number one, just after Jane Foster had become worthy and began to protect Earth in the other realms as Thor, the goddess of thunder. Despite the best efforts of Jane Foster and the Council of Worlds, sort of like the Ten Realms version of the UN, Meliketh's war continued to wage across all of the realms, except for Earth. Throughout Jason Aaron's run on Thor, in various forms, the War of the Realms has been a constant background plot. 
Malekith has become the ruler of the Light Elves due to his magic and political schemings, and invasions against the Dwarves and the Realm of the Dead have also taken place. To make matters worse, Thor is now considerably weaker, with Mjolnir having actually been destroyed during the battle for Asgard against Mangog. Now Thor must rely on new hammers that have been created by the few remaining doors. Yet these new hammers do not have the strength or the power of his old weapon. It is only now that the war has arrived at the last realm, Midgard, Earth, and let the battle begin. Asgard, once home of the ancient Norse gods, now floats throughout the cosmos, broken and destroyed. The Bifrost sitting cracked, unable to link the floating city to the rest of the Ten Realms. In his throne room amidst the ruins and destruction left behind by the Mangog attack, sits Odin. By my own blessed eye, I sure picked a hell of a time to stop drinking, he mutters sadly. The realm eternal is quiet for Odin. The city is like a tomb since the rest of the gods have fled to Midgard with his wife Freya. Suddenly the shadows of the throne room shift and someone approaches. Hey Thor, is that you boy? Come into the light, Odin calls, leaning forward in his seat. At the shadows harden, not on the image of Odin's son, but on an armored dark elf. No Thor, no light but gifts we bring. The Dark Elf says from behind its creepy mask, pulling a blade from its sheath. Others begin to appear from the corners of the room, slipping from the shadows behind the throne. Odin stands, energy launching from his hands, sweeping the elves away. Assassins, how dare you defile the halls of the gods? He cries, vowing to paint the walls with their bitter black blood. But one slips through, plunging his blade into the king of the gods' gut. The King of Altelheim bids you the goodest of knights, Odin, a one-eye. The elf cackles, and the rest of the group pile on the mighty king. Sounds of their blades piercing his flesh, filling the once hollowed halls. Meanwhile, on Midgard, Thor stands in the deck of his humble houseboat, staring into the setting sun, his hellhound Thori standing behind him, concern on his face as he asks if he can get his master a beer, or a troll to smite. Suddenly, the boat quakes as something falls from the sky, crashing into the deck. Loki? The thunder god shouts in surprise, blood covering the fallen trickster god as he bleeds from the knife wound in his stomach. It's too late, brother. The war of the realms cannot be stopped. He coughs, with Thor leaning over his brother, demanding to know who did this to him. Loki struggles, explaining that Meliketh knew that he would betray him. So, he betrayed him first. Fear fills Loki's eyes as he stares behind Thor, where a group of dark elf assassins appear behind him. Thor of Thunder, Meliketh, sends his warmest, wettest regards. They crow. Thor merely smiles, extending his hand. Tell your craven master, Thor has regards of his own. The hammers twist and spiral, destroying the boat, sending the dark elves careening away. Now armed with multiple hammers, the thunder god turns back to his brother. Get up, Loki. It's time we finish this. Take me to Meliketh, he orders. Thor sniffs the fallen god, looking up at his master with concern. Master, Thor, think. But the hound's words are cut off as Thori lifts his brother repeating his words. Finally, the magic begins to swirl around them and the two disappear. But master, wait! That not! Thori's words are lost on Thor though, and the hound merely looks in sadness at the place where his master once stood. Snowy peaks of Jotunheim swirl around them. Blast your lies, Loki! I told you to bring me to Malekath! Thor curses, turning back to his brother. Yet now Loki seems stronger, walking away, pulling the blades free of his stomach and he merely laughs. <laughs> For in this instance, he has told him the truth. The image of the trickster god begins to shift and suddenly, Melikath the accursed stands before him. Melikath! Thor curses, whirling on the sorcerer as the frost giants begin to surround them, pointing their massive spears at Odin's son. The blades sink into the ground, blocking Thor from his enemy. You think a few measly frost giants are going to stop me from bludgeoning you into oblivion, Melikath? This war ends here. Yet, at the gods' words, Meliketh merely smiles. I assure you, for so many of your friends, my war has just begun. Meanwhile, back at Midgard, in the city known as New York, Spider-Man is swinging throughout it. 
I just realized it's been a whole day since someone tried to kill me. Jonah had laryngitis. That old lady I saved from the muggers gave me a coupon for a burrito. I haven't even talked to myself in hours. The friendly neighborhood web slinger is saying out loud. Yep, it's been a pretty good day for Spider-Man, which definitely means wait for it. Suddenly his spider sense begins to go crazy and he swings down onto a rooftop where he sees a woman surrounded by dark armored foes. Come at me, you devils. We'll see how deep I can bury my regards into your gullet. Freya cries, swinging her sword at the dark elf assassins. Oh man, was tonight the LARPing meetup? I totally left my wizard staff at home. Spider-Man quips as he lands among the group. The elves order his death, letting Spidey know who the true bad guys are. Thanks, someone usually shouting to kill me is the sign that you're webbing the right people, as his webbing flies while he flips through the air. You must be the man of spiders. My son has told me so much about you over the years. Freya says, driving her sword into another dark elf. Swords, stabbing elves, funny way of talking. You're Thor's mom, huh? I'm practically BFFs with your son. Suddenly the door to the rooftop bursts open, revealing Sif, Hildegard, and Jane Foster. Swords at the ready. Hildegard turns to Spider-Man, brandishing her axe. Quickly, the warriors fill Freya in on the attack on old Asgard. It is the day that Freya has dreaded for a long time. But meanwhile, over at Greenwich Village, Dr. Stephen Strange is greeted by a crystal ball that begins to scream as a warning. He quickly begins to cast his spells. Over in Hell's Kitchen, Daredevil, the man without fear, hears every extra dimensional warning going off on Yancey Street. Over in the bar at Westchester, Wolverine orders one last beer as his adamantium bones start to ache. Punisher is aiming his pistol at criminals' heads as they kneel before him, energy crackling behind him. And he turns. The war has come to Midgard. Frost giants, fire demons, trolls, dark elves, and war angels. All manner of creatures of myth and magic suddenly fill the streets of New York. People begin to run and scream as the death and destruction reaches our world in a matter of seconds. Frank Castle squeezes the trigger on the criminal as a frost giant stops turning its massive head to stare at him. And then it swings its mace. Ah, oh, wish I'd brought a bigger gun. Frank snarls as he leaps off the rooftop, his pistol firing as he sails through the air. People run as trolls destroy cars and dark elves fire into the civilians. Drop your knives, boys. If you plan on leaving 47th Street with all your bones in working order, Daredevil orders as he leaps into the fight. The war angels begin to rip the helicopters out of the sky, yet suddenly Iron Man and Captain Marvel are amongst them. Greetings, pretty ladies. I'm sure this is just a big misunderstanding. Let's talk about it back at my place over some bubbly and birdseed. Tony remarks as he flies in. Stop flirting, Stark, and put them down! Carol Danvers orders. Yet Tony can't help it. Flirting is one of his superpowers. The two heroes fly into battle with the angels, but back on the ground. Daredevil turns to Black Panther, who has just arrived on the scene. Please tell me you brought backup. Panther nods. He brought the Avengers. Daredevil turns to see the unlikely group of heroes coming out of the smoke and destruction. Thor bites another dark elf as Blade stalks forward, drawing his swords. And behind him, She-Hulk rushes in to get the civilians out of harm's way. Uh, those are the Avengers? Daredevil remarks, and Captain America runs forward. I think you'll find that we're quite accomplished, Daredevil. The dogs knew, though. Suddenly, Freya fights through the carnage, the blood of the dark elves dripping from her blade. If Thori is with you, then where is Thor? Where in all of the realms is my son? Spider-Man swings back overhead as Captain America and Freya begin to fight back to back. I'm afraid I don't know where Thor is. His talking dog says that he disappeared with someone who seemed to be Loki but wasn't. She-Hulk rams into a large swamp mammoth, knocking it to the ground. I think I'm in love. One of the attacking trolls whispers, his friend turning back to him. I saw her first. Freya turns to fight, explaining to Captain America that Meliketh has brought the army of the Ten Realms to Midgard. We have to find my son, she begins to say, yet suddenly a black portal opens before them, and from the black magic comes Meliketh and his generals. All you're going to need is a sturdy stick and a white flag to surrender to the new lords of Midgard. He cackles, motioning to his allies, the Enchantress, Dario Agar, Ulick the Troll, the Cursed, and the Queen of Heaven. Meliketh orders them to surrender Midgard peacefully. Yet his words are cut off as Captain America's shield bounces off his head. Avengers, assemble! He cries as the heroes prepare to hold the line. But the group is scattered as a massive club lands amongst them. Oh, you tiny scraps of meat still think this is a war. Lofrid, king of the frost giants, crows, reaching out to the fallen Freya. The giant lifts the all-mother preparing to kill her as she readies her sword. I say the hell nay! A voice cries as a magical blade severs Lawfrey's hand, the king of the frost giants, sending it and Freya back to the ground. Lawfrey looks up, shocked to find his son Loki standing before him. 
yet Meliketh is suddenly there, taking the trickster god up into the air on his bog tiger. The two launch magical attacks at each other, yet both are interrupted by Doctor Strange. I'm going to have to ask you both to please leave this dimensional plane, he asks politely as he launches into his own attack. On the ground, Loki struggles to his feet as his mother stalks towards him. Loki, you are determined not to be welcomed in any realm, are you? Anger covering her face, but there isn't time. Loki quickly explains that Thor is trapped on Jotunheim and that they need him to defeat Meliketh. Freya merely glares at her son. After everything that he has done, why should she believe him? Because of this, mother. Loki looks at his mother's sadness in his eyes as Lofri picks up his son. The frost giant glares, calling him his one great shame. Opening his mouth, the blood sprays as he devours Loki in one bite. Ugh, I think I might throw up, Ghost Rider says from the ground. And while Spider-Man is telling him to aim the flaming vomit at the enemy, the heroes of Midgard look up at the continuing wave of Meliketh's forces. You know, just when I thought we could really use a Thor, we go from like eight of them to not one in sight, Iron Man states as they launch another attack. So where is Thor? Well, back on Jotunheim, lightning crackles as the thunder rumbles overhead. The icy blue blood of the frost giants begins to spray as Thor continues to swing his hammers in deadly arcs. Is that all you've got, Meliketh? Send more giants! The god of thunder will be the doom of you all! Flashing lights of emergency vehicles can be seen throughout the city, and the sounds of battle surround them as Eddie and his son rush down into the deserted alleyway. Where are we going? Dylan asks, his legs pumping to keep up with the much larger Eddie Brock. Just keep it cool. I'll take us somewhere safe, he whispers, slowly allowing the young boy to catch up. The two stop, staring up at the glowing blue portal in the sky, fear crossing Dylan's face while Eddie just sets his mouth in a grim line. They stop as around the corner, a massive fire creature stops in the street, listening for the sound of prey. Its head moves from side to side, and luckily it heads away from the two of them. With the danger having momentarily passed, Eddie and Dylan press forward, finally arriving at a large warehouse. Eddie is trying to keep Dylan calm, telling him that the safe house should be close by, when suddenly they hear a frightened scream. They turn, seeing three people running from the dark elves that stalk them. Listen to that! There's no sweeter sound in all of the realms, the elves cackle as they give chase. Eddie motions for the boy to get behind cover. He's going to help. What can you do? You're not Venom anymore, Dylan hisses. Yeah, but I'm ten kinds of stupid. The family cowers in fear as the dark elves move forward, their blades drawn. Hey! Eddie calls from behind, forcing the elves to turn. Leave them alone! This doesn't have to end messy, he warns, yet Eddie can't even finish his tough guy speech before the elves are surrounding him. Oh, look, brothers, a hero. Oh, he might be one of the mighty Avengers we've heard so much about. So fearsome, maybe we should flee. Eddie doesn't hesitate. His fist quickly connects with an elven face, but there's still two more and a blade slices across his back. A second pierces his side as the elves move quickly, and Eddie falls to his knees. Heroes die painfully. It's sad, though. The blood drips from Eddie's mouth as the elf leans forward, taunting him. Your kind isn't cut out for heroism, yet you long to embrace it. The elves turn, seeing the family escaping through the warehouse. Leave the sack of flesh. A hero should know what it is to die hearing a lullaby of shrieks. Elsewhere, Dylan leans out from behind his hiding spot, worried for Eddie's safety. What have we here? The Dark Elf sneers as his blade gets dangerously close to Dylan's face. He quickly throws up his hands, telling the elf that he surrenders, yet a evil grin spreads wider across the elf's face. Poor boy, I'm afraid we don't take prisoners. Good to know, Eddie growls as his arms wrap around the sneering elf's neck, twisting hard and sharp. The sound of snapping bones begin to fill the warehouse. Neither do I. Dylan is shocked as Eddie stumbles across the wall, weak from his blood loss. The small boy tries to support the big man as they continue forward, trying to reach their safe house, but unknown to them, they are being watched from above by three shriveled elves. Now that's interesting, one of the war witches mutters. A warrior, a would-be warrior, full of purpose and full of rage, yet without weapon or armor. The others warn her, now is not the time for games of corruption. Dylan and Eddie press onward, leaving a trail of blood splatters on the floor, smearing it onto the walls. And finally they arrive, moving into the room packed with guns and equipment. Whoa, that's a lot of guns, Dylan breathes. You don't think earthly weapons will help you, do you? The voice calls from the gloom of the shadows. The two turn, 
greeted by the sight of one of Meliketh's ancient war witches. You must know that your situation is more dire than that. Eddie pushes Dylan away, preparing to attack the witch as he draws a pistol from one of the cases. Dark magic swirling around the room as he aims, and suddenly the pistol is melting in his hands. It's not a firearm that you want, is it, Eddie? The witch grins as she watches him with darkness in her empty eye sockets. Floating above her hand, a dark crystal suddenly glows. A rock? I'd rather have a gun, Eddie growls, but the witch simply grins wider. A dreamstone, highly prized among my people. They give life to dreams, desires, and dreams. This one is specific. Weapons. Sweat begins to pour down Eddie's face. His wounds are horrible. I know this weapon you desire. Take the stone and you shall have it. I shall give you purpose with which to wield it. Eddie's hand stretches out with the stone shifting as he gets closer. Suddenly it melts and tendrils of power begin to wrap around his body. He stands ready, clad in a new symbiote with arcane ruins. This is different. Same, but different. He growls. Dylan looks on worried as he asks if Eddie is still in there. It's me, Eddie. I'm all right. He answers. The war witch moves forward. She has given Eddie what he desires. She has given him new armor, new symbiote powers. Within, he can heal. She has given him strength. Now you shall use these gifts for Meliketh's crusade. Her words are cut off as Eddie uses his new teeth to sever her arm at the elbow. Purple dark elf blood splattering the room, dripping from his jaws. Nah. The elf falls to her knees, clutching her wound. Why did I not foresee this? She crows, dark magic swirling, and the witch disappears into her portal. Eddie looks over his shoulder to see Dylan staring at him with fear in his eyes. Don't look at me like that. Only way to fight a monster is with a monster. He crosses the room, handing Dylan a weapon. You're, you're, you're leaving me? The boy timidly asks. I can't sit this one out. I'm supposed to protect people. You'll be all right, Dylan. He tells him as he exits the room, but before Dylan could stop him, Eddie hits the button to seal the doors to the safe room, locking Dylan within. In the city, fire and smoke rage around the group of dark elves as they play with the family that they captured. Shoot him between the eyes and I'll commit my next three murders in your name! One calls to his companions, aiming his bow at a struggling man, his family watching on in fear. Didn't I tell you, you don't want the kind of trouble a guy like me could bring. The elves quickly react to Eddie's entrance, but not quick enough. The first head is severed as the comrades leap away, firing arrows against the intruder. Yet their leaps don't take them far enough. Tendrils lash out of the new symbiote, piercing the warriors. Eddie turns, catching a fallen sword, slashing across their stomachs and through their armor. The war cry reaches him, and he turns to see a massive troll leaping towards him. War acts at the ready. The symbiote lashes out, ripping the head off of the troll's body. The voice in Eddie's head tells him to kill, destroy. It scares him. The symbiote stands amongst the bodies of its fallen enemies, roaring into the night. Who are you? One of the saved civilians asks. I am Venom, Eddie says. Elsewhere in the city, the war witch has materialized within a small apartment, still clutching her wounded arm. She should have seen that Venom was too unpredictable. To have seen his betrayal, she cannot let her sisters know of her failure. Who are you? What are you doing in my apartment? A voice asks. I can give you a gift, the witch offers, turning to the occupant. She offers another dreamstone, offers it to the man so that he may help her turn and kill Venom. If you aid me in destroying Venom, I will make all of your dreams come true. And stepping out of the shadows, Jack O'Lantern reaches for the stone. Don't mind if I do. In the safe house, Dylan opens the bags of MREs, staring at the wheat snack bread that he finds within. His face becomes a look of disgust. I'm supposed to eat this? In the city, Venom lifts a tank over his head, giving the civilians nearby time to run. His new suit, it's different. It feeds off anger and rage, and the tank belongs to Roxxon, who are aiding the forces of Meliketh. Anger pulses through Eddie, and the symbiote becomes stronger, throwing the massive war machine to the ground. The soldier driving the tank crawls away, screaming for help. Tendrils lash out, pulling a war axe to Venom's hand. With one mighty swing, he cuts the tank in two, and the soldier struggles to his feet, starting to run, yet the symbiote is holding on to some of the Dark Elf arrows. With blinding speed, the tendrils launch the arrows forward, embedding them into the soldier's back. The soldier still crawls, but Venom stalks forward, anger still pulsing through his body as he ends the fight with a swing of the axe. Suddenly, a blast of fire hits him from behind, and he roars with rage. Let me get this straight. You use an elven artifact to give you the suit of your dreams, and you still made it vulnerable to fire? Jack O'Lantern laughs as he flies by, riding on the back of a fiery goblin. Venom stares at the villain with rage in his eyes. 
miss me? The two launch into battle with Venom swinging his massive troll war axe, yet he is stopped as Jack breaks fire into his face. Lashing out blindly, Venom knocks Jack away, but before he can recover, the villain sets his dogs on him. Hellhounds leap from the destruction around them, barking and growling. Eddie likes dogs, but the suit wants battle. It wants death! The axe severs one as the other is pierced by the sharp tendrils. Not wasting any time, he leaps after Jack, clawing his way up a building. He turns, looking for his prey, only to be smashed against the side of the building by a giant mace. Be five over. I know three heroes who are going to squish Venom! The giant laughs as Jack-o'-lantern flies around them. Venom tries to launch away, avoiding another swing, only to be slashed by Jack. He roars in pain and anger. He's too small to fight the giant and he doesn't have a big enough axe. And he begins to think back at his life, his childhood, his time as a hero and a villain, his rage and his anger. Anger floods the symbiote, filling it with power and it grows. Venom's roar echoes throughout the city as he grows massive with the anger that lives within Eddie Brock. He turns now the size of the giants, biting down, sinking his jaws into the cold flesh of its neck, rearing back and tearing away the flesh in a fountain of purple giant's blood. The second falls as the axe cleaves its head from its body. The third tries to stop him, tries to wrap its massive arm around his neck from behind, yet the symbiote is a weapon. Spikes suddenly jut out of its back, piercing the giant's body, killing him instantly. Didn't forget about little old me, did you, big fella? Jack asks as he rains fire down upon the massive venom, and he tries to attack, but now Jack is small and quick, raining painful fire from above. The fire burns, coursing around venom, and he falls to his knees, shrinking once more to his original size. Eddie struggles from the fire as the symbiote burns and heals itself. He stands, the suit now torn and ragged. It changes and morphs, trying to protect him. Now it's armor. Shaped as a memory from the past, it's no longer a living suit. It is a Venom as guardian armor. Jack doesn't have time to finish Venom. He has a job to do. And the armored warrior watches from the ground as he flies away. Elsewhere, the war witch cackles. The more Venom fights, the more a warrior of Malekith he becomes. She orders Jack to finish the task. The villain launches forward his fiery glider, growing in size until it's practically a dragon. The beast breathes fire into the streets of New York. Venom's eyes grow big as he sees the civilians burn. He hears their screams. His eyes glow red as the rage begins to take over, and he launches himself upward, watching the destruction on a rooftop, clad in his Asgardian armor. The symbiote slides down, wrapping around the war axe that he carries, and he starts to swing it. He throws the weapon, sending it spinning towards its target, and the blade slashes across Jack's ribs, bringing forth a cry of pain and a gush of blood. And he smiles as he calls the weapon back, so unlike his old symbiote, yet so different. Jack hurls his own scythe, yet Eddie easily leaps away. But Jack has been transformed by the witch's magic too. The scythe begins to morph before Eddie's eyes, and suddenly standing before Eddie is a jack-o'-lantern golem, powered by magic. The Dreamstone says I can do anything, says the guy who can't shake the Halloween costume. Eddie roars as he leaps forward, the axe meeting the scythe with a hard metal clash. Eddie is strong. The axe is snapping his enemy's weapon, yet Jack uses the magic and the broken shards to suddenly pierce through Eddie's flesh. How do you like these pumpkins? The villain cackles, blood dripping out of Eddie's mouth, yet it simply reforms into a hardened shell of the symbiote. With a roar, Venom punches his fist through the golem Jack, ripping him apart in a spurt of dying flames. The real Jack is behind him now, riding his fiery creature. There you are. The real you want a shot at the title now? Venom turns, readying his weapon, yet it is slow and blasted from the roof in a wave of fire. He lands in the alley below, his suit smoking, tendrils writhing in pain. The suit begins to change again, not waiting for Eddie. He stands, turning to see the people hiding behind the dumpster, pleading with him to stop fighting, just let the villains move away. The mortal has left sacrifices, offerings to the burning throne. Eddie turns to see the fire goblins stalking down the alleyway towards them, their bodies the outlines of creatures in pure flame. Run! Get clear! I'll hold them back! Eddie yells to the people, turning to face his new threat. He moves to meet the demons toppling beneath their strength. The suit burns, twisting as he holds the creatures at bay. He manages to throw them away, yet their blast of heat holds him there. He remembers the, remembers the sun that he left behind, that he needs to protect. And once again, the armor surges with strength and tendrils lashing outward, marked with powerful ruins. His claws are now crystal sharp, cutting through the demon flesh of the goblins, molten blood dripping from his fingertips. 
One tries to escape with the armor taking over again, launching razor blades at the fleeing goblins. Eddie moves back into the street and he can see Jack-O-Lantern burning the people around him and then he realizes the armor can do anything. The dreamstone that powers it can do anything that he can imagine. So it peels off his body, becoming smaller bits and pieces. Eddie falls as the last drop drips away, which counted on my anger. But I'm done being used, he breathes. The tendrils and pieces of the armor move forward, finding those that need protection, those in danger. A woman cries out in startled fear, yet the armor is not hurting her. It's protecting her. Now she stands ready, clad in her own suit of Asgardian symbiote armor, and the symbiote finds others wrapping them in protection. Suddenly, a squad of Venom warriors stand ready in defense. Eddie stares down. The symbiote hasn't even fully left him yet, and his armored hand grips a powerful axe. The Venoms stand ready, fighting against the fiery demons of Nesselheim. The creatures then fall. Seeing the defeat below him, Jack bellows in rage. You can't get away from me. I'm a living nightmare. Eddie looks up, holding his axe in the air and dreams of the only Asgardian that he actually knows. Rain begins to pelt down where the lightning cracks from the sky, striking Jack and throwing him. The Dreamstone bounces away only to shattered human lies in the pavement. And from the rain strides Eddie Brock. Hiya, Jack. The villain tries to crawl away. He's a nobody, nothing. And Eddie agrees, turning away. The rain continues to fall, and the symbiote armor disappears. Returning to the safe house, Eddie forces his way in with a crowbar, finding the barrel of a rifle staring in his face. You're back and you're, uh, not Venom, Dylan notes. Eddie tells the young kid what happened. As long as they keep their heads down, they should be safe. Meanwhile, back on the streets, the rain continues to fall on the pulsing dreamstone, and a hand reaches for it. Nigeria. The jeep speeds through the grasslands with Spider-Man at the wheel, the rest of the League of Realms riding in the back. Titania, the giant, running alongside them, smoke curling off the bodies of animals as they pass, leaving the smell of charred flesh in the air. Hmm, smells good, Ood the troll remarks. Spider-Man knows that this is awful, yet the League are no strangers to war. Spider-Man turns to the person riding shotgun. Hey, I'm sorry, uh, what's your name again? I've met a lot of new people in the last few days. Once again, the wood wizard of Vanaheim, known as Roe Bloodroot, introduces himself. Of course! How could I forget? Spider-Man notes before asking how long their stealth spell should last. Bloodroot confirms that the spell should allow them to enter the city undetected, provided the angels do not have counter spells. Spider-Man has a task force, and he is on a mission. We don't need to hide from these angels! Let them see us! Ood screams from the back, waving his battle axe maniacally. What is the plan again? Honey shot the light up, asks offhandedly. Spider-Man just steps in the gas. A work in progress, he confirms. Once again questioning why Thor put him in charge of this strange party earlier. I don't get it, why me? Spidey says, looking up at the big god of thunder. Thor explains that the League of Realms has always been made up of members of each realm. And with the war now being on Midgard, they need someone from Midgard to lead them. And you're the most Midgardian man that I know, he says with a smile. Ha. Huh. Thanks. Spider-Man is still unsure though. He's not a warrior. He's just a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Yet Thor smiles broader. That is why you're perfect, Spider-Man. Now we go back to the present. With the Jeep passing another encampment, Roe points out that the city of Lagos is ahead. The plan is simple. They sneak into the city, rescue any captives, and find the angel in charge. Her name is... Spider-Man shuffles through the name Rolodex in his mind, trying to remember. Fernandi, Roe offers. Right, Fernandi! Spider-Man speaks over his shoulder, giving everyone their assignments. Elfman! My name is Sir Ivory Honeyshot of Elfheim. Honeyshot! You're the dwarf person! It's Grobeard of Nidovar! Son of No Ears! Son of Edwound! Spidey just keeps going while Screwbeard runs through his whole family tree. Troll guy! Ood. Excuse me? My name is Ood! Ood, you're with Giant Lady. Within the city of Lagos, Fernandi, the leader of the Angel Warriors, sits within her crumbling church. Her wings stretch behind her as she cries gently into her hands, memories of her argument with the queen flashing through her mind. She begged the queen, begged her, to take her place. The queen of the angels spreads her wings in anger. Melekath has destroyed Asgard for them, has offered them wealth untold from his war on Midgard. Fernandi bows her head. She knows the rewards will be great, but this price is too high. It's not fair. The warrior's thoughts are interrupted as a voice calls out to her, and she stalks forward to her soldier, who reports that a vehicle approaches the city walls. Is there an old god? 
Fernandi questions, and the warrior nods. Fernandi knows that the League will think that they are cloaked. Let them think that their trick worked. Let them into the city, and when we have them surrounded, RIP OUT THEIR HEARTS! Spidey looks around as the jeep creeps slowly through the bombed out city. Titania's bow held at ready behind them. The quiet is unsettling, he remarks, and Screwbeard frowns in the back seat. It is annoying. Above them, the angel stand guard merely floating in the air like silent sentinels. Yet Ro looks up, knowing that something isn't right, and is surprised to find the angels are watching them. They can see us! He cries, and with these words, the battle begins as the angels swoop in for the attack. As the rest of the league leap out of the jeep for the fight, Spider-Man floors the pedal. Retreat if you must, Spider-Man, but we will stay and do the fighting for you. Ood cries as he swings his axe. Realizing his team isn't leaving with him, Spider-Man hits the brakes, leaping into the fight. He lands back to back with Honey Shot, firing his webbing at the angels to bring them down. The white licorice that you fire from your wrist doesn't seem to be killing any of them, Spider-Man. The light elf notes offhandedly. Yeah, I know, I'm not trying to kill them. Suddenly, Screwbeard's blunderbuss is pushed into Spider-Man's face as he calls him a traitor. Spider-Man pushes the barrel aside. No, I just, I don't kill people. The rest of the League continue to fight, and they begin to question why Spider-Man is even there. Spidey watches as Screwbeard launches his grenades at the Angels, missing and blowing up a building behind them. Fear and anger fill him as he launches himself at the building, knowing that there must be people inside. He crashes through the window, calling out for anyone, and a young boy peeks his head from behind the door frame until his family calls for him. Spider-Man jumps in the door, though, and he finds the family hiding. I'm here to help, he explains. He has to get them out of there. He also needs to find the leader of the angels, and he asks if they know where she is. The little boy points out the window, indicating the church. Of course, the leader of the angels, the church. Why didn't I think of that? Within the church, Fernandi stands, watching the explosions, seeing the bloody feathers of her sisters falling. Hey, Big Bird! Spider-Man calls in the window as he lands in front of the warrior. Yet Fernandi launches forward, grabbing the hero by his head. She launches through the air, smashing him hard against the wall, throwing him back down to the ground. She is a high angel of the army. She is the embodiment of death. She raises her glowing sword, ready to end Spider-Man. I cannot be stopped! She growls. I'm so sorry, Spidey tells her as he stares up at her blade. The angel pauses, stunned. I am sorry. Do you ever wish you could stop? Spider-Man asks her. He does sometimes. How? The warrior asks, peering at him suspiciously. Spider-Man extends his hand to her. The first step is helping me up. The battle continues to rage on outside when suddenly the order to stand down rings from the top of the church. These creatures are not our enemies. The League stares up at Spider-Man standing beside the leader of the angels. What is going on? Diplomacy. I don't like it. Ood remarks alongside his comrades. Standing amongst her warriors and those that she once called her enemies, Fernandi tells her story. The angels are forbidden to fall in love, and that is when she met Anemone. But when she met Anemone, she could not help herself. Then Meliketh came. He made a deal with the Queen of the Angels that he would destroy Asgard for them if they would help him finish his war on Midgard. Meliketh wanted only one thing for the bargain to be struck. He had never killed an angel. He wished to know what it felt like. The warrior was chosen at random, and it was Anemon. Fernandi pleaded with the queen, begging her to take her lover's place, but it was too late. She watched as Anemon's body slumped to the ground, and all Meliketh did was shrug and walk away. Fernandi stands before the League of the Realms now, and explains that Spider-Man is the one who broke her out of her blood-stained sadness, and showed her a different way. So what? You're one of the good guys now? Honeyshot asks. And Fernandi declares that she owes Spider-Man, and her angels will find a different path. Yet, the rest of the League still doesn't trust her or her warriors. Spider-Man tries to reason with his teammates to explain, yet his arguments fall on deaf ears. Do much talking and angel nonsense. We shall head north where the Dark Elves run wild. Screwbeard cries as he, Ood, and Honeyshot turn to leave. The only two who decide to stay are Titania and Ro Bloodshot. Thor made you our leader for a reason. Fernandi stands at the web slinger, questioning why he let his soldiers leave. I can't convince them to stay right now. There's not enough time to debate on the merits of winning hearts and minds. We'll join them later, after we release the prisoners that you have taken. Spider-Man and the Angels cross through the broken and destroyed city, finally arriving at the gates of the detention center that the Angels have erected. He moves forward, preparing to set the people free when a warning from Bloodshot splits through the air. Incoming! The ground explodes around them and everyone is forced to get to cover when suddenly there's a sharp crack as gunfire fills the streets. Oh good, bullets! Fernandi peers through the broken shards of the wall around them, and it's a human army seeing that their defenses have been lowered. She prepares to attack, offering to silence their weapons, but Spider-Man stays her hand with a quick snap of his webbing. No! We won't hurt them! Just 
Keep them busy for a moment, he orders. The web swinger turns to Roe, asking for a distraction while he orders Titania to join him on door duty. Green magic begins to flow from Roe Bloodroot, and he floats into the air in a ocean blue bubble. The military turns their weapons at this new threat, firing hastily. The rounds have no effect, and suddenly the bubble bursts and the water flows down on the enemy, sweeping them away with the current. The rest of the military prepares to continue firing when the officer calls for them to stop. Look, it's the prisoners, they're free, the soldier calls out. The soldier is confused when suddenly Spider-Man stands before him. All right, I can explain. Spider-Man stands before the commanding officer and he quickly explains how the angels have switched sides. The officer leans in very close. They invaded our city. They took control of it and imprisoned our people, he growls. Spider-Man understands, but now the angels are going to work alongside them to defend the city. Fernandi steps forward. That's right, General. My soldiers are now your soldiers, she explains. The warrior angel turns to the wall crawler, pledging to join him in his fight against the Dark Elves. That is, if you would have me in your League of Realms. Vatican City. Ood swings his axe, cleaving through the bodies of several Dark Elves. Screwbeard fires his grenades, blowing up the small crowds, while Honeyshot leaps and flips, firing his pistol into those who stand in his way. The group turns, seeing the teeming mass of Dark Elven army before them. There are so many! Where did they all come from? Yet Ood just smiles. It doesn't matter. We know where we'll be sending them. Suddenly, the army turns and retreats, leaving the three warriors standing slightly confused. Of course they did! They smelled the stench of the comrades' viscera staining the walls. Ood claims raising his fist in victory, yet Honeyshot turns, staring at the massive warrior behind them. Or not. Ood and Screwbeard rush into the fight, but are knocked aside with little effort. Ood falls smashing into the ground, while Screwbeard tries to rescue his friend he's thrown clear across the courtyard. Curse raises her gaze upon the light elf. Now, now, perhaps we can talk about this. Honeyshot offers his hands, hovering over the pistols at his hips. But you really don't seem like the talkative type. He draws fast, the pistol bucking in his hand as he fires. The rounds bounce harmlessly off of Curse's armor. She grabs his hand, crushing it with her weapon, and he fires with his right to the same effect. Suddenly, Curse leans in very close. Somebody kill me. Memories of her time fighting alongside the League of the Realms fills her mind when she was known as Wazira. She had agreed to be Melika's proxy in Nastrand prison, hoping that it would reunite her with her fractured people. Soon though, Melika started his war and freed her. She could still feel the sting of his magic piercing her back, transforming her into curse. She stands over the fallen honey shot, repeating her request, kill me. And Ood's axe clashes with her armor from behind. Gladly, he cries, yet she whirls, her fist connecting with his face, throwing him aside again. Honeyshot struggles up, watching his comrades get beaten. We need to regroup. And suddenly he backs into someone behind him. Looking over his shoulder, Spider-Man stands there with the rest of the League at his side. What are you doing here? Saving the day, obviously. Now, what is that? Spider-Man responds, pointing to the armor-wearing warrior tearing through them. Honeyshot quickly explains the League's history with Curse, catching Spider-Man up to speed. Yet before they can act, the retreating Dark Elven army has suddenly returned, and the warriors prepare themselves. Spider-Man gives everyone their orders, but Titania will wake up Ood the Troll and help Ivory Honeyshot take care of the Dark Elves. Rowan Fernandi will help him with Curse, yet Fernandi stands fast. I will deal with the Dark Elves. I yearn for their blood in my hands. Spider-Man nods, and Honeyshot offers his assistance with Curse when suddenly Spider-Man pauses. Where's Screwbeard? The dwarf comes sailing through the air, firing his grenade launcher rapidly at the armored cursed. Die a thousand deaths, you infected ghost rectum! Never mind, I see him. With this distraction, the League leaps into battle with Roe beginning to probe Curse's magic armor, leaving only Honeyshot and Spider-Man to deal with the menace. That still doesn't mean we should go easy on her. Spider-Man jokes as he swings into action with Honeyshot firing his pistols through the rain. The rest of the League launch into the fight with the Dark Elves, magic and steel biting deep into their flesh. Bullets bounce off Curse's armor as Spidey leaps in for a kick. Why is she making this so hard? Before you showed up, she asked me to kill her. Honeyshot asks, firing again and again, and Curse's massive fist flies towards Spider-Man's back. But Honeyshot is there to push him out of the way, and the blow catches him in the spin, throwing him away. The elf lays on the ground, unable to move as Spider-Man leaps to defend him. Bro, anything? He calls to the wizard. He could feel something beneath the armor fighting back, and the image begins to form in front of him. The one of a soul trapped within. Honeyshot looks up as the face of a dark elf forms, and his eyes widen and shut. It can't be. Wazira? The elf stammers as he sees his old comrade. Spider-Man seems confused, but subtly is snagged by curse, his body being crushed. 
He's saved though by Fernandi. As she comes charging from the battle, grabbing her, is plowing her through a building. The rest of the league begins to reform with Roe, believing that there might be a way to magically pull Wazira out. And they charge into the building after their new friend. Curse rains blow after blow into Fernandi's face, slamming her heart into the wall. And the angel begs for this, begs for death. Fight back. Curse stammers, but Fernandi refuses. Kill me! Both warrior women beg at the same time. And suddenly a web shoots out, pulling Fernandi back outside, with Spider Man standing over her, demanding to know what she is doing. She knows now. No matter how many dark elves she kills, the scales will never be balanced. She will never get her love back. What's the point? Spider-Man gets it. He knows what it's like to lose someone pointlessly. He knows what she's feeling right now, but their moment is interrupted as the building begins to crash down around them. Curse stands before them again, yet her body begins to glow as Roe finds cracks in the armor's magic and begins to apply pressure. Curse screams in pain as Spider-Man tells Roe to keep it up. He's knocked aside by another blow and Fernandi is pulled close to Curse. She begins to scream again as Roe continues to work. He screams for them to get clear, for the explosion will be powerful. Fernandi closes her eyes, prepared for it to end. Suddenly, she's yanked free as Titania grabs her and runs clear, with Curse exploding in a ball of bright, magical energy. And standing in the enemy's place is the Dark Elf Wazira. I'm free, she stammers. Spider-Man and Rogue grab her before she falls as the words of thanks pass through her lips. Inside the church, Fernandi looks at the female giant while Titania clutches her in her arms. Why did you do that? She asks. Titania looks down at the female warrior in her hands and finally speaks. We all lose people important to us, but we keep fighting. Not to kill what is ugly, but to save what is beautiful. Wazira staggers free of Spider-Man and Rose arms. She doesn't need to rest. She needs to help the rest of the league. And outside, Ood and Screwbeard ready their weapons as an army of Dark Elves surround them. Honeyshot, still unable to walk, leans his weight on the dwarf's leg and cocks his pistol. I must say, gentlemen, it's been an honor fighting alongside you, the Light Elf tells his friends. Don't say your goodbyes yet, Honeyshot. The League of Realms is just getting started, Wazira cries. And with the League whole once again, they launch into battle against the vast enemy. Loki suddenly sits up, last remembering his own death. But the smell of death and blood are now around him. His head pounding, confusion filling him as he looks around. The bodies of dead trolls and elves surrounding him in the smoky battlefield. I hope I didn't do this, he mutters, staring at the carnage. You didn't. A voice calls her behind him, forcing him to turn. I did. The ancient Loki smiles. He's larger than Loki can remember, being his body is covered in armor, and he's carrying a great club. Oh, bloody hell, he mutters. It's going to be a worse morning than he thought, the trickster god cursing as his younger self steps forward. What do you want, you cheap Viking conjurer? Yet his younger self merely laughs, commenting how Loki hates to be confronted by his true self. The two stand amongst the carnage of war, with Loki asking his younger self if he was responsible. Aye, not bad for an afternoon's work. It certainly did the job. <laughs> it made me smile. He grins at the sight of the older Loki's disgust, and Loki stares down into the blade of a sword, piercing a man's eye. All of this for his own amusement, all to take his mind off the troubles of Thor. Suddenly, he turns at the sound of a cart being pushed behind him. Look out, corpse burner at work, the young voice calls. Turning, he sees a young dark elf pushing his cart towards a roaring fire, hearing the words of the master calling to a young Meliketh. Loki is stunned to hear the name of the accursed one, and he turns to his younger self. Who gives a Dors fart what his name is? He'll just be some dark elf war slave. He'll likely be dead before the end of the day. The younger trickster snorts, seemingly not caring who this Meliketh is. Yet, Loki knew that he wouldn't. He watches the young elf turn his cart over, tossing another body onto the fire. He knew that he would live a long life of horror and hardship, a life that would leave him frightfully strong and scarred, forever accursed, and eventually, the man who started the War of the Realms, the man who has invaded Earth. Horror fills Loki's face as he realizes that Meliketh will never forget the fruits of a war that he grew up with. A war that he started by the gods. It's my fault. I created Meliketh. Loki finally realizes, looking at this former self, this past of his. He runs forward, calling out to the young boy. He can stop this all from happening. He can be taken away from all of this. And upon reaching the young elf, Loki merely passes through him, tripping and stumbling on a rock, turning to himself. What did you do to me? 
he demands. Yet the true question is, what did Loki do to them? Don't you remember? You got us killed! Young Loki snorts, and images of being devoured by his father, Lofri, fill his mind. The feeling of the teeth grinding into him suddenly overpower him. I was eaten by Lofri, he remembers. I'm dead, I'm in hell! You are my hell! He mutters, turning to his younger self, but his younger self once again snorts. <laughs> this isn't hell! Although you might wish it was before your visits are through. Anger fills Loki and he demands that his younger self end this, launching at him with magic flowing from his hands, but the younger Loki merely waves his hand, launching the older one away. Loki now stands in Jotunheim, watching as his father, Lofi, rages and shouts about someone leaving flowers at his doorstep. His axe slices through the head of another ice giant, with icy blood raining down as the head bounces to a stop in front of Loki. I suppose the ice of roses were a poor choice, but in my defense, I never celebrated Father's Day before. He mutters at the decapitated head. Loki watches as his father continues to rage, killing more of their giant brethren. This happened weeks ago. There's nothing he could do to stop it. I wouldn't feel bad if I were you. They're frost giants. It's sort of their way of life. The child version of himself calls out from behind. Loki just glares at himself. He's already met the ancient Viking version of himself, and now he's dealing with the present, or at least the present that should have been. The child Loki shrugs, but Loki continues to glare. He didn't want this. He didn't want to be the villain again. He did what he had to do to save Lady Freya. He stabbed her in the back to save her. The images of him slicing his mother in the back with his poisoned dagger fill Loki's mind and he stares in shock at his own hands. Finally, he turns back to child Loki, glaring at him again. And I would do it again! He snarls, but the child simply shrugs. I have to hand it to you, Loki. When you tell a lie, you sure stick with it. They stand now in his room surrounded by a pile of useless things. Loki traded him away, traded the child Loki for a mouse hole in his father's castle. Tell me this isn't the biggest blunder you've ever made, the child turns, angrily glaring at the older version of himself. Loki doesn't answer, instead staring down at a photo of Lady Freya, his mother. They say the Norns are dead, but our fates are up to us, he whispers. And it doesn't feel that way. It never felt that way to me. He turns back to himself, ordering himself to take him away from this place. Let him die in peace! Child Loki merely shrugs and sneers. You think you're here because of me? You're here because of you. You're here because even in death, you can't help but admire yourself. And with a smile, the child waves his hand and casts Loki away. He sees himself now, his eyes blackened by dark power as he pierces Ego, the living planet. Behold Loki, the necro god, the all butcher. He screams out with Loki floating off in the distance, watching himself. This can't be real. I'm already dying. This is a lie. This must be. But the dark Loki, the necro god Loki, turns, an evil grin twisting on his face, floating at Loki, smiling. Lie? Why would I tell a lie? There's no one left to listen. <laughs> but Loki pushes him away, trying to lash out with his magics. He won't let it end this way. I will not be the greatest monster who ever lived. But the black tendrils lash out, wrapping around his limbs, and the dark Loki leans in. He wants to know. You're not the ultimate Loki. I am. He launches Loki away as he flies through space to find his brother, and he spins in the void, fear washing over him. This cannot be real. I'm dying. I was eaten by my father. I can stop this. All of this. He shouts, closing his eyes, concentrating. He can end this. Then he opens his eyes, and a scream escapes his lips. He floats in the acids of Lofi's stomach are burning through his skin, his arms floating by his face, and he screams again, realizing, Why am I alive? Please, by all the gods, Loki must die! Next, we bring you the Asgardians of the Galaxy, number 18, the continued tie-in series to this story. Shards of the Bifrost, the rainbow bridge of the gods, float through space, drifting gently away from the floating tomb of Asgard. A portal opens emitting a large spaceship that lands on the former home of the gods. With a steaming hiss, the ramp lowers, revealing Angela, Scourge, Thunderstrike, Throg, Urzul, the Dwarf, and Annabelle, the Asgardians of the galaxy. Quickly, the team begins to move through the destruction of the former city. Uh, Angela, does the home of the gods always look like this? Thunderstrike asks, looking at the ruins. The Warrior of Heaven reveals that Asgard is but a shadow of its former glory. Ready your mace, Thunderstrike, she warns him, and they continue to move forward until Angela looks at their dwarf, questioning whether the Nagalfar be 
beacon is safe aboard the ship. Urzil waves his hand dismissively. It's locked aboard the ship, sealed in a vault, warded by fire and ice and a few mystic traps. Do not put your faith in your traps, Dorf. A powerful voice calls from behind them, and the team turns to see Heimdall stepping from beneath the shadows of the ship, carrying both the beacon and the fragment of the rainbow bridge that they use to power their ship. The Nagalfar beacon is a powerful weapon that can aid us in the battles to come, the god nods. And I'm gathering all of the shards of the Rainbow Bridge. Heimdall informs Angela of Meleket's army, of his forces marching on the final realm. Marching on Earth. We need your sword, Odin's daughter, he tells her. Annabelle steps forward, concerned on her face. Final realm? He's talking about Earth! She cries, and Thunderstrike steps forward, determination on his face. He has family and friends on Earth. Heimdall tells them of the battle, how the heroes of Earth fight to hold back the new lords of Midgard. I have gathered enough energy from the Rainbow Bridge to send you all back. And Angela extends her hand, motioning to the beacon, taking it from Heimdall's hands. It was crafted as a weapon of war. Give it to me and we will put it to use. Finally, Heimdall turns his unseeing eyes towards Annabelle Riggs, the Valkyrie. He begins to give her a warning of the future, yet she stops him. No offense, but I got friends on Earth who need my help, so maybe save the doom and gloom prophecies for later? Multicolored energy begins to surround them and the team vanishes, leaving Heimdall alone in the Tomb of the Gods. In Manhattan, the battle has already begun, with the team quickly spreading among the other heroes, fighting against the forces of legend and myth. Spider-Man swings over the teams as Scourge and Urzel open fire on the Dark Elves. Thunderstrike swinging his mace, casting lightning while Captain America fights giants. The shield bearer stops briefly, turning to the young Thunderstrike. I knew your father, young man. I think he'd be proud of you joining us today. Kevin appreciates the words, but he's still worried about the rest of his family. And that's when Spider-Man swings by. Hey, we're evacuating people as fast as we can, kid. Is that a frog in a Thor costume? The battle rages on, yet there seems to be no end in sight for Meliketh's forces. Annabelle drops in using the power of her Nova helmet to save the people who can't escape. But the power dims and fades and she is forced to run. As the giant chases them, the energy begins to crackle around her as her image alters and changes. Valkyrie has joined the fight. The angels of heaven join the battle and Angela clashes swords against their leader, cursing her for joining forces with Meliketh as the battle rages on around them. Scourge struggles to his feet, arrows sticking from his back. You gonna live? Punisher grunts and the executioner nods, so Frank Castle tosses him a rifle. Then take a gun. The two stand together, firing into an army of Dark Elves. Above the battle, Throg, seeing a plume of fire rising from Central Park, leaps into the air, heading to the home of his people. Lightning cracks as he lands in the park, seeing the charred bodies of his former brothers, staring in sadness as the park burns around him. The fire imps come from a tree, screaming for death and pain. His small hand tightens on the hilt of his hammer, and the rings begin to fall. Surprise begins to fill the imps' faces as they look up, just in time to see the lightning strike them. And with that, the battle continues. Stand together, Asgardians! Do not falter! Angela cries, launching herself in a bog mammoth. No matter how many of Meliketh's forces fall, though, there always seems to be more. Valkyrie flies in on her Pegasus, her sword slashing through the invading force. Yet she begins to shift as she feels Annabelle taking over again. I'm sorry, Valkyrie, but I know you'll never leave the fight and there's something I have to do. The young woman apologizes as she points the winged horse away from the battle. Knowing that his friend may need help, Thunderstrike rushes to her aid, with Scourge calling for him to crush any elves that you see along the way. The remaining warriors turn as more enemies begin to converge upon them. We might be down half our team, but the enemy forces don't seem interested in letting us regroup. Urzel comments, loading his weapon. A few blocks away, Annabelle flies in, seeing her lover Ren twirling around a group of dark elves, her dancing ribbon slashing them to pieces. The flying horse bowls through the rest of the elves, scattering them. Quickly, the young woman dismounts, rushing over to embrace her love. But before the two of them can kiss, Annabelle begins to disappear, drifting away as if on a breeze. Thunderstrike arrives just in time to see her go and hear Ren call her name. Annabelle now stands before a collection of Valkyrie warriors, armor shining, swords drawn. One points the tip of her blade at her. Where is your counterpart, Brunhilde? Leader of the Valkyrie, she demands. Now we bring you the War of the Realms, issue two. Greenridge Village, a large crowd has gathered outside of the Sanctum Sanctorum as the battle rages elsewhere in the city. Everyone stares, slightly confused, at the glowing green spectral Basset Hound that floats before them. Right this way, New York! You know the evacuation protocols, no pushing! He yells to the crowd as they begin to enter the Sanctorum. Don't worry, there's plenty of space for everybody. The safe room can hold a couple million full-grown humans, he continues. Move along, no staring at the ghost dog, just follow the talking snakes! The young woman next to him tries to help. Hey girl! 
What up, you evacuate here often? One of the snakes asks a passerby. But as the people begin to push inside, Jane Foster steps out. The ghost dog floats to her, questioning whether the Asgardians have been evacuated. Yes, Bats, but there's still another longboat coming from the Bronx, she informs him. The dog nods and continues to talk, yet Jane isn't listening anymore. She can feel something. Something calling to her from the battlefield. Elsewhere, the bodies begin to litter the ground around a familiar van, and a group of dark elves stumble and fall away. He's just one man! Why can't you useless mongrels bring him down? The leader screams, stepping forward, yet the answer is simple. The dark elves have a natural weakness to iron, and the Punisher has an endless supply. Frank begins to open fire, shooting a burst shot into the dark elves as another tries to sneak up behind him. But the elf merely gurgles as the three adamantium claws pierce his chest. Wolverine, heard you were dead. Nah, just really drunk for a long time. How have things been, Frank? I'm reloaded. Frank nods. Good catching up. Frank aims his weapon and he opens fire as Wolverine charges into the fight. Meanwhile, Captain America dashes up the stairs of an apartment building, ordering the civilians to get to their evacuation points as he charges past them. Knowing that he's high enough, he leaps through a window, smashing into the frost giant's head, shield first. The massive enemy stumbles and falls, shaking the ground around them, with Cap landing, rolling back on his feet. Somebody find me another giant! I'm going back up! Above the city, Iron Man careens through the endless valleys of steel, concrete, and glass as the warriors of heaven chase him. T'Challa! Could we use the teleporter at Avengers Mountain to get out of here? He asks. Sif launches herself at a swamp mammoth, and the Black Panther doesn't even slow his attack against the Fire Rims as he informs Stark there's something crashing all the global networks. I can't raise the mountain. Elsewhere, amongst all of the destruction, Dario Agar, head of Roxxon, laughs, congratulating his employees over the phone as he drinks coffee. I have a spell, but it comes at a heavy price, Doctor Strange calls, as Curse wraps his hands around his throat. Still, I would have it done in five minutes, but I'm having some performance issues right now! Elsewhere in the battle, the rest of the heroes continue to fight on. Okay, big and fiery. You must be from hell, right? Spider-Man quips as he leaps and flips from Cinder. I'm the Queen of Muspelheim! Hold still now, she bellows. <laughs> I'm so confused. Is there a map around here somewhere? And he leaps again. Yulik collides with She-Hulk, complaining about how he has to fight the green half-wit. At least yours has meat on its bones, Enchantress states, looking bored as she casts spells at Ghost Rider. Robbie Reyes tries to block her attacks with his hellfire and simply responds, Keep it up, lady! You're gonna piss off my car! And you wouldn't like it when my car's pissed off! Suddenly, the Enchantress is knocked away as a Viking longship rams into her, with Jane Foster leaping clear of it, a sword in her hand as she surveys the battle. What in God's name are you doing here? Lady Freya cries as she rushes over. The two dodge clear of a rushing ice giant as the battle continues on. The air is suddenly filled with the sound of a rolling horn, echoing throughout the battle and the city, giving everyone pause. The two warriors look to the skies as an army of Valkyrie riding upon winged horses pour forth from a rainbow portal. At the head of the charge flies Odin, armed with his spear riding a black stallion, fire snorting from its nostrils. Sound the horn so that the whole damned realm can know that the god of gods has arrived and that hell comes with him. Odin rides forward, his body glowing with the Odin force as he pierces straight through a frost giant's chest, bursting out the other side covered in gore. If Meliket wants a war, buy my beard, we'll give it to him. Brunhilde rides forth, her blade slashing giants as she comes, with Jane rushing to her, sliding on the back of her pegasus. You're strangely familiar, mortal. Do I know you? She questions. Jane nods, telling her to picture her with a hammer in her hand and it'll come. Now take me to Melikath! Odin pushes back the lords of Midgard, finally floating down to his wife. You look like hell, husband. She informs him. The king shrugs off the comment. I'm as strong as a build snipe! Freya hangs her head, sadness filling her as she tells Odin of... Loki's death. In that moment, the king of the frost giants pushes through the smoke and the flames of destruction, and anger fills Odin as he wheels his horse, energy crackling around him. Yet he is slow, and the giant smashes him hard into a wall. Brunhilde and Jane ride through battle, their swords cutting through the forces of heaven quickly. Realization dawns on the Valkyrie that she rides with the former goddess of thunder. I thought you'd be more blonde. They see Meliketh riding his bog tiger in the distance, yet Jane will not be the one to end him. The Pegasus tilts, throwing Jane onto a rooftop. You've already fought enough battles to last a lifetime, Jane Foster. Go and enjoy life. You've earned it. 
she orders her swooping away. Jane turns, though, shocked at the sight of the vampire hunter Blade, locked in combat with three war witches. She rushes forward, her blade clipping one of the witches long enough to throw off their spell. Elsewhere in the battle, though, Doctor Strange can feel the magical interference lift. His eyes glow as he lifts from the ground and he begins to cast his spell. By the beard of Ashante, let the purple veil be rent asunder. I, Doctor Strange, will pay the soul toll for all who pass. A massive portal opens. Blue tendrils begin to snake outward into the city. Meliketh and his forces converge on the portal, wishing for no one to escape the war. Yet Brunhilde swoops in, crying for aid. Valkyries, protect the portal at all costs! She orders as she rides straight for the Dark Elf. Meliketh, meet Dragon Fang. Meet your doom, Dark Elf. She hisses as their blades lock. Yet Meliketh merely smiles. All I see is a dead woman on a horse. Throughout the city, the tendrils snake out, pulling all of the heroes and civilians alike into the portal. Steven, your spell is too strong, Captain America cries as he's being dragged in, when suddenly all of the heroes stand in the war room of the Avengers Tower. We have to go back. The fight isn't over, Jane calls as she rushes forward, but Freya disagrees as she drags her wounded husband into the room. Meliketh's forces are too strong. They need her son. They need Thor. They need to stop Meliketh's black Bifrost in Svratelheim. They need to end Roxxon interference with the global networks. Captain Marvel steps forward. This is war. She will fight it in the trenches with every soldier that she can find. I can think of no better captain for the job, Captain America tells her. They will need to reach the other realms, yet Heimdall still cannot see. He won't know where to send them if they can't open up the Rainbow Bridge. Freya steps forward. They all have a mission. In her absence, she names Jane Foster all mother of Asgard. Yet, Jane is not listening. Tears fill her eyes as she looks up at the war room monitors. The news shows the massacre of New York. The bodies of the fallen Valkyrie are scattering. Pegasus' blood is filling the streets as the Dark Elves continue to wrestle with them. Yet the battle is not over. On a pile of bodies, blood flowing from dozens of Dark Elf daggers sticking from her body, Brunhilde fights on. Is that all you elves got? My blade is far from dry. She screams. She turns, glaring at the sea of her enemies. Malekath, stop hiding behind your magic's end. But her words, they are cut off as shock fills her face, falling to her knees, finally staring down at the glowing blade that is piercing her chest. Meliketh stands behind her, a smile pulling his lips to his ears as he rears back with his blade, and he swings. All Mother Freya walks into the Avengers Mountain Armory, with the walls covered in all manner of weaponry befitting the various members of the team. If it is true that Meliketh has created a black Bifrost in Vratelheim, then shutting it down is the only way to halt the flow of his troops. She explains that she is crossing the room, heading to Thor's vast arsenal of magical weapons. The goddess lifts one of Thor's oldest weapons, the axe known as Yonborn, the weapon that wounded even Apocalypse. The All Mother stares at the axe, Knowing that with Odin wounded, she is the only one who can lead the mission against the Black Bifrost. She turns, offering the weapon. Which means I must ask a great favor of you, she says, offering it to Captain America. I need you to go to Jotunheim, find my son, and bring him home. Cap takes the axe in his hand, nodding in his acceptance. When do we leave? At the gate of the Bifrost, Daredevil stands with Heimdall, the former guardian of the Rainbow Bridge. Heimdall warns him that by taking up the sword, he will see all and tread where only gods have before him. Well, if there's one thing that I've learned, I'm not a very good Catholic. Murdoch states as he grasps the hilt. Pulling it free, the bridge is once again activated. And throughout Avengers Mountain, the different strike teams are sent on their missions. Behind Daredevil, Jane Foster enters the chamber, armed with Odin's staff and the Destroyer at her side. Meliketh will know the Bifrost is active and he will come for us. We're the only warriors Asgard has left, so get ready to hold the bridge. The All-Mother orders it. We now move into the Strike Force Land of the Giants book. Spider-Man sits on a frozen hill overlooking Avengers Mountain, thinking back on the strange event of his day. Suddenly, the snow crunches behind him, and startled, he finds Captain America standing before him, dressed for the cold, wielding a very large axe. We need to save the world, he simply says. Peter nods. He was just thinking that, and he points out Cap's new weaponry. This was Thor's axe when he was young, Cap explains. Ah, I had a stuffed bear. It was called Fluffles McGee. Probably not as significant. Cap turns, motioning for Peter to follow him, yet Spider-Man is startled when he sees how Captain America got to the top of the mountain. The wings of a golden armored Pegasus beat in the air, pushing the wind around them. Cap mounts the animal and calls for Spider-Man to join him downstairs. Sure, I mean, I could swing down, but... 
Spider-Man's cries of joy echo throughout the mountains as the two of them swoop off of the mountaintop, riding the back of a Pegasus, something Spider-Man never thought he'd be able to do. And inside of the Avengers War Table, Cap explains their mission to save Thor to his strike team. Wolverine, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and Spider-Man will be on this mission with Cap. That's not really a mission. Something this epic should be called a quest, Danny Rand notes with a smile on his face. Quickly, the heroes agree to accompany Cap and the team move down to the armory. Feel free to choose whatever Asgardian weapon you would like. They're surprisingly well labeled, Cap motions. So Iron Fist chooses the twin swords of Sprag, whose edge all Jotunheim fears. Luke chooses the hammer of rock, which cracks giants like eggs. I'm good, Logan notes, popping his claws. Only Peter seems hesitant. He's not really a weapons and smiting kind of guy. Cap nods and hands him a golden shield. They can be useful. He says with a large smile on his face. And from behind, Logan slaps a helmet on Spidey's head. Magic helm. He says with an even bigger grin than Cap's. With the team fully armed, Cap suddenly turns. Daredevil, can you hear me? I hear you, Steve. I hear everything. The voice fills Roger's mind and the team stands ready. Captain America orders him to open up the Bifrost. At his station, Daredevil twists the ancient sword that acts as a key to the Rainbow Bridge and the ever watchful Heimdall is over his shoulder. In the armory, the bridge opens with the cold winds whipping the room into a storm. Everyone get ready, Cap orders, confusing Luke Cage. Yet the Valkyrie's Pegasus were bred for war and though their riders have fallen, they are still prepared to fight. I am so into this! Spider-Man cries as the five heroes ride the flying horses on the beginning of their quest. Ah, uh, we need a name, Danny comments as he turns to Logan. No, we don't. How about the four horsemen of the apocalypse or the four horsemen who all punched apocalypse? He asks. No. Iron Fist turns to his friend Luke, who is merely shaking his head. There's five of us. You forgot to count yourself, didn't you? Luke asks. I forgot to count myself. Suddenly, the rainbow portal opens up and the team is flying over the frozen wastes of Jotunheim. A river the color of purple flows through the valley. Do you think we can find Thor? Cap asks, turning in his saddle to Wolverine, who merely nods. I say we just follow the river of giant's blood. The heroes swoop low, flying over the vast purple river of blood. Shh, easy, buttercup, Spider-Man says, leaning in, patting the neck of his steed. You named your horse? Logan asks, raising an eyebrow. You didn't? My horse is called Horse. Spider-Sense kicks in a moment too late as a massive arrow sails through the air, piercing Luke's Pegasus, knocking the hero free. More arrows begin to fly from the ambushing frost giant archers, piercing Logan's horse next. With a growl of anger, he sails through the air, popping his claws, colliding with a giant, burying the blades deep into his chest. Luke sails in next, dropping another with his mighty hammer. You are not hurting Buttercup! Spidey cries, blocking the arrow with his shield before swinging in to crunch the frost giant in the nose. The giants stumble in fear as they see the fearsome weapons that our heroes hold. And seeing this, Peter turns to Logan. Hey, what does the helmet do? Wolverine continues to slash at the downed giant, telling him, I don't know. It was the most ridiculous helmet I saw in there. I mean, it has a little shade to cover your neck and we're on a dark ice planet. <laughs> Wolverine simply grins, still slashing. Spider-Man looks embarrassed at the ground. You know, I preferred it when you were dead, Logan. The battle is quickly over, yet all but Spider-Man's Pegasus have fallen. The heroes turn to see the final Pegasus bowing before her fallen comrades. Logan turns, motioning for the rest of the heroes to do likewise. You want us to bow to horses? Danny questions, yet Logan merely glares, ordering them to bow again. The heroes do, paying honor to the fallen warriors. Are we just going to leave them here? Questions Peter. Surprisingly, a voice answers. No, they will not be left here. Peter springs away from the voice of Buttercup. Whoa, you're a talking horse? The Pegasus explains that all horses are talking horses, yet it seems that Spider-Man's helmet is allowing them to understand each other. I am Queen Arctorius. She introduces herself. That's a nice name. Buttercup was also nice. The rest of the team look on as the strange horse noises keep coming out of Spider-Man. Finally, the Queen orders the heroes forward, for the God of Thunder needs them. She will say the words to usher the fallen kin souls to the sky. The team pushes forward, pushing through the land of ice and snow, following the river of blood, and once that river ends, it turns into a mountain of bodies. Thunder rumbles as lightning flashes, and standing amongst those bodies, blood dripping from dozens of wounds, stands the God of Thunder. He stands with one arm missing, while the other clutching a hammer that has been broken over his enemies' heads. More giants! Send me more Odin damned giants! Send them all! He cries out. Wolverine has seen this. It's a berserker rage and he has been there before. For Luke Cage, it was one time in Harlem. For Iron Fist, he once raged fighting a group of ninjas. I had a particularly bad day with Hitler. 
Captain America nods solemnly. The group then turns to Spider-Man to see what his rage was. Uh, yeah, there was this one time on a Black Friday sale. It's all a bit of a blur. Next thing I know, I bought a microwave. The heroes know that the fight will not end until Thor's enemies are defeated and from behind, the queen arrives. Peter tries to explain that this isn't her fight. We are of the Ten Realms. If the realms fall, stallions, mares, foils will all be enslaved, she explains as Peter gets on her back and her wings unfold. You fight for your kin and I will fight for mine. Let us fight together, noble jester warrior. With these words, the two fly into battle and our heroes charge, fighting the frost giants. Captain swung his ax, Luke Cage's hammer fell over and over again and a blow from a massive club sends him flying. Yet he struggles to get back on his feet. Come on! He cries in anger as he readies his fists. The battle raged for hours, days maybe. But finally, the frost giants fell. Captain America struggled to stand, yet Thor was there, hand outstretched. On your feet, Captain. The helmet! Fight me the damned helmet! Spider-Man screams into the wind as he kneels over the body of the queen, pierced by a massive arrow. Sadly, Logan tosses Peter the magical item. He struggles to hear her words over the blizzards of Jotunheim. She does not wish to be buried in this frozen land. Take me home, noble Chester warrior. The queen's final words echo in his head. Peter did his best at burying the queen in the sky so that her soul could soar within the clouds. The heroes take a knee for their fallen comrade, for war will just have to wait a moment. After her conversation with Captain America, which sent him off to Jotunheim to try and save Thor, Freya moved on to her next task. Captain America suggested that I speak with you. He doesn't like you, but he respects you. She says, turning to speak with Frank Castle, the Punisher. With his black bifrost, Meliketh seeks to corrupt every part of the earth. Meliketh is ink in clear waters. To touch him is to become him. Frank just grunts. What you become is your choice. Can't put that on someone else. Briefly, Freya stares at the Punisher, evaluating him with her cold blue eyes. For a man surrounded by majesty and terror, you are remarkably simple, Frank Castle. Frank merely nods. Frank is one of the simplest things. Point and shoot. Meliketh is from her world. He's your problem to solve. Do what it takes to solve it. Yet Freya knows that this is easier said than done. She needs mortals to aid her in her task. Those who are burdened by anger. Frank nods. I could list them off, but you're gonna have to convince them yourselves. So Frank gives her names. She-Hulk, Ghost Rider, Blade. He tells her not to think of them as people, but as weapons. It is later that Freya explains the mission to the group of heroes, with Jennifer Walters cutting right to the point. Don't lie to me. Is what you're asking possible, long shot or not? Can we even succeed? This is a warrior's chance, Miss Walters. The All Mother nods, and the group look at each other. Ghost Rider merely wanting to know if the creatures deserve the pain that they are going to bring, while Blade hesitates to have to clean up the god's mess. Frank just turns. Bullets don't work on these things. Bullets work everywhere. Mankind's one enduring achievement, she nods. The goddess then raises her hand. Time is of the essence. Do I have your commitment? Jennifer has her reservations. The team is a group of madmen and murderers, but they all raise their hands. Looks like we're yours, she says. Freya smiles in Asgard. They don't believe only tales of legends. She needs to see the heroes fight, to know that they have what it takes to complete the mission. Magic begins to glow through her and the room is bathed in light. Ancient power! I call upon you. Test them with their fears. Show me their darkness, she cries. Jennifer Walters stands before a judge, her cousin, Bruce Banner. She always thought he was weaker, that he let the monster win. Rage filling the Hulk as he launches himself at her. She struggles briefly before the monster within takes over, and She-Hulk meets her cousin in the battle as her true nature takes over. She will never be as civilized as she wants to be. Ghost Rider, in his dream, is standing in the crumbled remains of New York. From the ruins steps out Johnny Blaze, the king of hell, his chain of hellfire lashing out, the will of vengeance mocking him. You are no rider. Yet our new Ghost Rider breaks free of the chains. He is not afraid of penance. He has mastered his fears, his rage. Blade stands before an ancient gothic castle. The door falls inward at a strike from his boot and before him sitting on the throne of human bones sits the king of vampires himself. You will stop protecting mankind. You will stop hunting our blood. You will accept your destiny. I am your future. The old Blade intones in anger. Blade lashes out, sword striking the darkness. Blade knows that his greatest enemy will always be himself. One by one, the heroes realize that what they are seeing isn't real. 
and Frank Castle kneels in a dark room, a smoking pistol in his hand, and the bodies of his comrades littered around him. Lady Freya, the others have figured it out. I think they passed your test. One by one, the heroes defeat their worst fears, and one by one, they pass the test. They break free, striking out against the one who put them in this place. And that's when Freya meets them in battle. The Void dissipates and the team stands once again in the war room. She turns, bidding the group to ready themselves for the toils that lay ahead. Later, the team has arrived at Svetelheim, disguised as the members of Melikath's black forces. The plan is suicide. We should just start stabbing everyone, Blade hisses from beneath his dark elven armor. Yet Freya tells the Daywalker to keep his sword in its sheath, for she will do the talking. Suddenly, one of the guards steps forward. What in slimy hell are those? He questions, indicating She-Hulk and the poorly disguised Ghost Rider. Freya steps forward, noting that they are a troll and a fire goblin, ready to be sent to Midgard to join the glorious battle. Uh, ain't Meliketh great? Ghost Rider tries to help in the ruse. That is the ugliest troll I have ever seen, another Dark Elf laughs. She-Hulk growls with anger and takes a step forward, yet notes how large the other two Dark Elves are questioning their clans. Having given up on the plan, Frank shifts aside his mossy cloak, bringing up his submachine gun and opening fire. So much for the plan. If you squint, they look like vampires. Blade cries, throwing his disguise away, drawing his sword. Freya's blade bites into the dark elven flesh as she turns to her team. Ryder, no point in hiding. Call forth your steed. And the Hell Charger appears, with the team riding forward on the blaze of Hellfire. Traveling across Svetelheim, the team quickly arrives at the Black Bifrost. Frank opens fire as Blade's sword slices through the Dark Elves guarding the Black Gate. Blade notes that they are going to need explosives for the gate, which they didn't bring. A wire the car to blow, Frank offers over the sound of gunfire. I don't recommend touching the ride, Punisher, Ghost Rider notes. Yet Freya knows that they have all of the explosives that they need. Don't we, my Lady Hulk? In response, Hulk slams her fist down, building up enough gamma energy within her. The battle continues to rage on as the Hulk's energy builds, and finally she has enough, readying to destroy the Black Gate. While everything else is going on, the heroes continue their various missions throughout the Ten Realms, and the war continues on Earth. Deadpool dives away, his pistol blazing at fiery sharks that are following him. I swear to God, if you guys ruined Shark Week for me! Then he realizes that his bullets are having no effect, so the merc with the mouth turns and runs into the woods. You do you! He cries before turning around, drawing his swords, slashing back through the beasts. Nobody likes something that can take six bullets to the head and keep coming. He then stops, staring down at the melted katanas in his hands. And that is speaking from experience. The creatures turn back towards him, and Deadpool is forced to jump off of a cliff towards the ocean below. Okay, okay, you win! Stop chasing me! He twirls in the air, lifting his mask, blowing a raspberry back at the sharks as they plummet towards the fire extinguishing water below. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you dispense of a school of lava-fueled nightmare fish. He turns and sees the creatures still coming at him, though. Their fire burning through him fast. Deadpool tries to swim, but suddenly the jaws chomp down upon him. Darkness surrounds the murk as he finally opens up his eyes. It's surprisingly dark as that of a fire shark. Light fills his eyes again as the shark is suddenly slashed open and the king of the sea stands before him. Explain yourself. Namor demands. <laughs> well, I'm Deadpool, sort of like Spider-Man with guns crossing the moral and ubiquity of an early Wolverine, the Merc over explains. Like many heroes, Namor does not find Deadpool very funny, and he demands to know why he was in the stomach of a fire shark. Quickly, Deadpool fills the king in on the events on the surface, the entire War of the Realms. And so now a bunch of D&D weirdos have turned up on Earth in an episode of Game of Thrones. One of the late season mind blowers. Lots of CGI, Namor. Angrily, Namor motions to the massive window behind them, blaming Deadpool for bringing Asgard's problems to him as they stare out at the Mer people battling against the horde of fire sharks. I mean, that's not what I was trying to do, but hey, look, Captain Marvel! Carol Danvers comes roaring into the battle with Lady Sif at her side. The two quickly defeat the rest of the sharks with Captain Marvel stepping into Namor's throne room. Permission to enter, your majesty. Permission denied, Namor simply states. Yet Carol meant it as more of a courtesy and continues onward anyway. The captain came to propose a truce, hoping that Namor would aid the planet in its war with Meliketh. Yet Namor declines, as always believing the surface's problems are their own. Meanwhile, Deadpool stands over the corpse of a shark, introducing himself to Lady Sif. Was it you that brought the fire sharks under sea? She questions with an upraised brow. Seemed like a good idea at the time, Asgard lady. It's Sif. Good work. Lowering their body temperature makes them easier to kill. In disgust, Carol turns away from the Submariner, telling him to save himself. I always do. 
Namor growls. As Captain Marvel stalks away, Deadpool calls out to her again. Hey, are you guys putting a team together? Cause I'm like totes down to save the world. Meanwhile, back at the Avengers Mountain, Carol overlooks the view screens that show her images of the Earth. While the strike teams all set out against Meliketh, Punisher and Ghost Rider's team going to the Dark Elf Realm, and Captain America and Spider-Man's team going to Jotunheim, the land of the giants to try and recover Thor, it was her job to protect the Earth. How's it going? Questions Deadpool. Well, nobody's dead yet, so better than expected. Your optimism is positively contagious. The Merc turns away as Lady Sif, standing over the war map of the planet, orders him to leave Carol alone. Standing over the table, Sif pushes these small markers to indicate where the enemy forces are supposed to be, while Deadpool continues to make his jokes. Suddenly, he jumps as Weapon H is standing over his shoulder. Did you guys get your own Hulk? He gets interrupted again as Venom is now behind him. Okay, okay, I'm getting the military theme here, but that's not soldier Venom, that's tentacle tongue 90s Venom. Carol explains that it's all hands on deck. This is war. Their job isn't to win, it's to lose slowly, to hold the line. By standing in the way of an enemy spear, the soldiers behind you can break through. Haha, <laughs> grim, Deadpool notes. Ice covers the landscape in Arizona as the Frost Giants patrol, and inside a Stan weapons facility, Winter Soldier and Black Widow sneak quickly through the security systems, moving deeper inside. With some quick leaps and twirls, the two go through the lasers, finally arriving at the armory. The two spies then gather what they need and they begin loading it onto a military aircraft, when suddenly the roof caves inward as a massive blue foot stomps into the room. I'm telling you, something is skittering down below! The frost giant booms above them. The head leans in next, seeing the two tiny humans. The spies dodge as a hand reaches to grasp them. Natasha, fire in the hole! Bucky yells as he tosses a grenade. The explosion blows up the giant's hand, forcing it to rear backwards. The aircraft flies out of the building, banking against the giants to only be yanked out of the sky. The engines begin to whine as they continue to try and push forward. Back to Frosty, Carol cries as a blast from her energy smacks the giant in the face. The Quinjet opens fire as well, banking past the massive head. Still weirds me out that you know how to fly a Quinjet, Sif. I have flown a Randy Pegasus into a battle against many centaurs. This iron box is child's play. More Frost Giants join the battle. Open the doors, we'll do the hitting. Weapon H calls as he and Venom launch themselves into the fight. One giant falls immediately as Weapon H snaps his spine. Venom's tentacle blades slash the limbs off another rapidly. Yet another giant slams the symbiote into the ground. Surprise fills its eyes though, as the symbiote slithers and crawls its way back up the limbs of the Frost Giant, stabbing it through the brain and ending its life. Later, the battles continue across the Earth, and in Sweden, Deadpool and Black Widow fight the Dark Elves in battle mechs. You gotta take a selfie, Natasha. If the world sees you fighting evil in one of these battle suits, they are so gonna finally make that Black Widow movie. Despite Sif's blade and Bucky's guns, the Dark Elf forces continue to overwhelm our heroes, and Black Widow and Deadpool are forced to abandon those suits, allowing them to detonate and take out as many Dark Elves as possible. Yet despite their efforts, the heroes are still backed into a corner, surrounded by their enemies. Quickly, Carol speaks into a medallion. Captain Britain, we need an exit. She calls and a portal opens up in the wall behind them. The bearded superhero leans his head out. You rang. Quickly, the team passes through the portal and they arrive at a well-kept green lawn. Welcome to Braddock Academy, the proving grounds for wizards and kings alike. Captain Britain explains. Wait, 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 wait. We had a magical portal to buff Dumbledore's doorstep. Why have I been getting my butt numb in the Quinjet for the last week? Deadpool demands, yet Carol explains that Captain Britain owed her a favor. This was a one-time deal. Captain Britain's goal is to keep the children of his school safe. I will not involve them in the deadly war, he explains. Deadpool turns and begins to rant about how everyone keeps telling him about what his team can't do. Well, what would you have us do, Wade? I don't know, anything, everything, win one battle, then another, and so on. But they don't have an army, and they don't know where Meliketh is. When suddenly Captain Britain leans in, informing them that Black Knight and his team have been battling Meliketh in London as early as this morning. Let's go get the goofball, Deadpool cries. Concerned excitement fills Carol's eyes. Maybe they can do this, maybe they can end the war right here. Meanwhile, in London, Spitfire sinks her teeth into a dark elf's neck, spitting out the flesh. These things taste awful, she growls, and the rest of the team finish their fight within the pub, with Black Knight pulling free his ebony blade from a fallen elf. Union Jack, do you think that that was the last of them? Believe so, the hero answers as he puts two more bullets into his last foe. The Black Knight orders everyone to take a breath while they can, and Union Jack obliges by pouring a pint. 
Suddenly, the wall explodes inwards as a swamp mammoth charges in. Well, what do we have here? All cozied up in the alehouse. Hard to blame you. I suppose one last drink before the end. The grinning face of Melikath the accursed crows. Union Jack chugs his beer. Meanwhile, back in the War of the Realms, issue 3, page 12. Our heroes fall quickly to Melikath and his forces. And finally, the accursed one stands over the Black Knight. Ebony blade in his hands. This is quite the extraordinary sword. Admiring the dark metal. So lovingly cursed, so beautifully bloodthirsty. The Dark Elf turns to see his forces rampaging through the destruction of London. You once called this Europe. It will now be the new Svletherheim. He explains, lowering the point of the sword to Black Knight's throat. Suddenly, the Quinjet streaks through the sky with Carol and her war avengers joining the battle. Get ready to eat that sword, you bastard! She cries out, ordering her team into the fight. Yet Cursed launches herself, blocking Carol's assault on Melikath. Venom roars as he attacks the Dark Elf. My, my! Aren't you all a pretty sight? Back at the Bifrost, Daredevil can see everything, and he can see that Melikath holds the Ebony Blade. He can see that Midgard is slipping away. Not if I have anything to say about it, Jane Foster says from behind him. Suddenly, a dark portal opens up behind them, and they see the chamber is filled with dark elves hell-bent on destroying the Bifrost. Jane, Heimdall, and the Destroyer launch themselves into the fight, protecting the bridge and their forces throughout the realm. Daredevil, now a god, draws the Bifrost Blade and leaps into battle as well. And the war continues. Back in Avengers Mountain, Tony Stark and Shuri work alongside the dwarf, Screwbeard, to build a new weapon. He would think that the two of them are dwarves, except for the fact that Tony doesn't drink and Shuri's a vegan. Elsewhere in the base, Black Panther prepares the defense as Melikath's horde has reached their doorstep. And on the other side of the world, Raz Solomon, an agent of Wakanda, is fighting against the forces of the Roxxon Corporation to restore the world's communications array. She screams over the radio that Roxxon has taken control of Antarctica as she banks hard away from the helicopters that are chasing her. In the dark oceans, Namor continues to fight against the fire sharks that are threatening his kingdom. And back in London, Venom launches himself at Meliketh, his blow sending the Dark Elf straight through a bus. You're one of Thor's greatest enemies! We ain't impressed! The symbiote snarls, but the elf merely dusts himself off, the ebony blade glowing in his hands. Oh, I'm sorry, has our fight begun? The elf laughs. He has been talking to the symbiote learning of its dark history. Venom attacks again, though, realizing the sorcerer's plan too late. And with an evil smile, Meliketh stabs the ebony blade deep into Venom. One can never have too many weapons. The blow causes the shockwave, and suddenly Venom and the elf are gone. Back at the Bifrost, Daredevil could hear Meliketh laughing, Thor screaming. The Bifrost blade bites deep into another dark elf as the fight continues, and suddenly he stumbles and falls. It's too much. There's too much noise in the universe. One of the elves sees Sees his chance slipping through the warriors, a bomb in hand. Look out! That one's getting past! Jane yells as the Odin spear stabs another enemy, and with a bright light, the bridge explodes into a shard of rainbow colors, cutting off the heroes across the realms. Meanwhile, back at the end of Strike Force, Dark Elf Realm. Wait! Freya cries. Something has happened. She could feel it across the realms. The Asgardian Bifrost has been destroyed, and if we destroy this one, we are trapped forever. The goddess turns to the Black Kate, her team standing amongst the hundreds of bodies of their fallen enemies. I will hold the bridge. The rest of you take the Bifrost and get back to the front lines. Freya stands forward. She knows the only way to hold the Black Kate is to claim the power for herself, so she grasps the sword, drawing it forth, filling her body with the dark energy. Dark eyes glowing from a black energy to Turn, staring out into the next wave of the Dark Army as they rush for the bridge. Manhattan. All is calm within the storefront of a music shop as a young student plucks away at the piano. The teacher leans closer to him. Hold your hands together, a bit further apart. You have to get used to the stretching, he tells him. The door then crashes open hard, startling the man and his student with the light blocked by the man who enters. You there, music teacher. Frank Castle grunts as he stalks across the room, fear gripping the man, and he begins to stammer. Oh god, I oh got I I brought back some weed from Colorado. It's legal there, but I should have known that something like this would have happened. Frank Castle stands over the man, murder in his eyes. I need piano wire, he states simply. The man leans back in his chair, surprise on his face. Sir, what piano do you have? Frank just stares. Sweat pops up on the man's head again, and he quickly gets Frank a spool, offering it to him on the house. Frank turns, runs back out, calling over his shoulder for the man to barricade his store and not come back out. The War of the Realms has reached Midgard, and Frank's 
Well, Frank's busy. He runs, tying the wire to a street lamp. Turning, he quickly pulls his pistol, firing at the dark elf poised over a woman with a sword about to drop. The woman screams as the elf slumps dead at her feet. He doesn't even slow down, running to the other end with the piano wire across the street. His trap is set and he draws his weapons. The Dark Elves come running down the street, riding the backs of Hellhounds. The city belongs to the Dark Elves now! Kneel or die! Their leader cries, too late as he sees the wire. He doesn't even have time to slow down as that wire slices through his neck, severing his head in a spurt of purple blood. Frank turns, holding a weapon at each hand, and he continues to fire. Stay out of New York, he growls, firing his submachine gun through the skull of a hellhound and into its rider. The enemy drops, and Frank takes a second to reload. Suddenly, the ground quakes and cracks around him, and he remembers that he's sick of this Avengers crap. The frost giant stands over him, swinging a carriage that luckily is missing its horse and rider. Frank leaps away, avoiding being squished flat. He then turns, pulling the pins on two grenades, tossing them at the giant's feet. The Punisher runs for it, feeling the heat of the explosions, hearing the screams of pain from the giant behind him. A little man hurt Kaskalaka! The giant screams, his prey ducking underneath a gas truck. Oh, I'm gonna do worse than that. He growls at himself as he cuts the fuel line on the truck. He rolls out, leaving his lighter behind. The giant seems confused as he lifts the truck and doesn't find the little man. The flame licks the fuel as it drips from the cut lines, creating an inferno that engulfs the mythical creature's head. No, 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 no! The giant screams, hopping up and down in pain. It turns, looking at the tiny human that hurt him. A car careens towards the giant, its driver lost in fear. The family within screaming as they are lifted from the ground. Put them down! Frank orders, his hands clenched in fists. I'm right here! Come get me! He screams, trying to get the giant's attention. But it doesn't work and the car is heaved across the street. Frank jumps, managing to get clear of the explosion. Thinking that his foe is dead, the giant turns, lumbering off into the city. And watching it leave, Frank manages to tear himself away from his urge to follow the monster. And he turns to the burning car. He doesn't hear any screaming, and that's a bad sign. So he pushes through the flames, feeling the heat searing his skin. The father is still alive, crying for Frank to save his family. But the man doesn't realize that his wife and his son are already dead. Broken bones sticking through the flesh in his leg as he's dragged free. Yet... He can't feel the pain and he still calls for his family. I'm sorry, they're gone, Frank tells him, hoisting him on his shoulder, carrying him away. Breathe into the pain, I'll get you help. A few blocks away, the two come upon the Silvari Memorial Hospital. The scene is in chaos. Doctors and nurses trying to stabilize patients in the streets as the hospital burns behind them. Frank puts the man down, calling out for help. Before he could turn away though, the man pulls him in close. I know who you are. Find that monster, avenge my family, he whispers. There's no place in this universe that is safe for him now, Frank nods, when finally one of the doctors comes running over. She tells him to take the man somewhere else. They're evacuating into New Jersey through the Lincoln Tunnel. Sounds like a suicide mission. Through the perfect place of an ambush, Frank notes quickly. The doctor stares at him for a second before turning away. They have no choice. They are a low-income hospital that no one cares about. Frank stands amongst the chaos, watching the doctor leave. A few streets over, a prison bus is stopped amidst the traffic. Yo, man, you gotta get us out of here! One of the prisoners calls, but the guards know that they aren't going anywhere. The windshield shatters inward, startling everyone as a massive fire spear impales the driver. Oh, meat! <laughs> the fire goblin cries as the prisoners scream. A grenade then impacts into its head from the side as Frank dashes along the crowded cars. He reloads and fires again. The creature, well... It falls dead. Frank calmly picks up his weapons, and he steps aboard the bus. Fear crosses everyone's face as they realize the Punisher just saved them. The remaining guard tries to step forward, but Frank drops him with a taser, and then the Punisher stares at the men before him. Killers, thieves, and rapists. All of them. He drops a bag of swords and axes. Normally, I'd kill you all and go get a sandwich, but you've seen what is happening out there. I need a few bad men to help some good people. Everyone stares at him in silence. We're gonna help a hospital evacuate through the Lincoln Tunnel. I'm your warden now! One of the men in the back jumps up, running forward, calling for the others to rush the Punisher with him. No one does. Frank raises a pistol, stopping the man at his tracks. He looks around to see if anyone plans on joining him, and no one does. Frank fires. 
In the Lincoln Tunnel, the hospital workers are preparing to enter when suddenly a fire drake comes flying out. The dark elves leap out of the shadows, their blades glinting in the sunlight. The elf is impaled, though, falling in a pool of its own blood. The doctor turns to find Frank and his prisoner standing behind her. You were wrong, Doc. I care about innocent lives. Frank turns to the rest of the workers, giving them orders. Stay 20 yards behind us and I'll get you through this. A short time passes and the hospital staff and patients are pushing through the darkness of the tunnel. Around them, the tunnel is a darkened nest of destroyed and abandoned cars. The sounds of strange beasts and metal clashing with flesh can be heard up ahead, where Frank and the prisoners are fighting. Suddenly, the doctor and a patient scream as something comes out of the darkness. Following a little too close, Frank growls, waving his hand for her to stop as he turns back to the troll that they're fighting. The creature throws the prisoner aside with a mighty yell, grasping one in his massive hand. But before anyone can come to the man's aid, the troll bites down at his arm, tearing it away. I hate Earth! Food is terrible! The troll laughs as he spits out the arm and tossing the man aside. One of the prisoners steps into Frank's line of sight, screaming for him to shoot the beast. I'm not even supposed to be here! He cries out. No, you're not. Frank hisses as he fires into the prisoner, dropping him. The creature roars as it rushes them, and Frank fires again, piercing its eye. I'll kill you! The monster roars in pain, but Frank fires again, taking out its other eye. The troll falls, now blinded, and it tries to crawl away. The rest of the prisoners look to Frank, but he merely puts his finger to his lips, motioning for them to be quiet. The troll's cry of pain is bringing its allies here. Growls from further up the tunnel can be heard, so Frank draws a grenade. Pulling the pin, he sticks the weapon into the troll's ear, moving away, allowing its head to explode behind them. The group moves forward in the dark, stopping briefly to steal some food off a vendor cart. They're only halfway through the tunnel now. Feels like we've been down here forever, one of the prisoners remarks. Frank stares at the sign, memories of trips spent with his family filling his mind. Of his children fighting in the back seat while they were stuck in traffic, but he has to shut it away. On your feet! We're moving out, he calls out. They stop letting the evacuees catch up to them, and the doctor thanks Frank for his hard work and turns to her employees. She orders everyone to take a rest. Frank turns back to his men. Up your gut. Check for survivors. The group moves forward, but suddenly the darkness is pierced by a strange fire ahead. What's halfway here? A voice calls out from the crackling of fire. The fire goblins attack, forcing Frank and his men to fight. So he fires, the gunshots echoing throughout the tunnel. The prisoners keep fighting with their swords, but they fall one by one. For every goblin that is dropped by the swing of a melee weapon, the fire goblins sink their teeth into the soft flesh of a few prisoners' throats. Hellhounds arrive, taking more of the men. So Frank turns as one of them chomps down on the prisoner. He douses the beast in kerosene, tossing his lighter and setting the monster ablaze. The screams from your herd then reach Frank's ears. Damn it, that's the doc. The prisoners keep fighting with one calling that they'll be holding the line while he checks it out. The mace smashing the head of the goblin that he's fighting. Before Frank can move though, he's cracked from across the head from behind. The mace hits him hard. He falls, his pistol clattering out of his hands. He struggles for it, but it's picked up before he can get to it. So I was thinking that now is a good time to discuss what happens when we get to Jersey, one of the prisoners says, pistol pointing at Frank's face. The man has others at his back and he leans in and close. We're almost to New Jersey, Frank. We helped get these people there. I think we're owed a promise of safe passage, he tells the Punisher. The evacuees start to catch back up and the man flips the pistol in his hand, offering it back to Frank. We know who you are, Castle. If you swear on your dead family's souls that you won't kill us when we get there, you can have the gun back. Frank stares over the man before pushing the pistol aside. I swear on my dead family's souls. He gets up and walks away. Anybody still alive when we get the jersey gets their life back. The group pushes forward, stopping briefly as they see the light at the end of the tunnel. Frank turns, walking towards a semi-truck that is pulled to the side. Banging on the fuel tank gives a slight bong of a full tank. Good, he grunts, turning back to the doctor. He tells her to keep her people quiet while they give the all clear to the other side of the tunnel. He stops as sounds begin to come from the dark. An arrow flies as the troll comes screaming out of the shadows. Frank ducks, firing his weapon into the beast, and the beast falls and Frank is on it fast. How many do you got behind you? The troll refuses to answer, so Frank brings the butt of his weapon down. Once. Twice. Answer! I'm a scout for the 9th Troll Brigade. I've been ordered to seal any evacuation points in the city. The creature gurgles through its broken teeth and purple blood. Frank nods and fires. You failed! 
The prisoners turn as more of the creatures begin to move up, but suddenly one of them turns on the others, bashing its friend's heads in, reaching for the gun that Frank allowed him to keep. He spins, aiming for the Punisher, only to be dropped by a bullet. Frank whirls, bringing his submachine gun up to the others. Hey man, I'm aboard the plan! The prisoner stays holding his hands up. It doesn't matter though, as a flaming arrow pierces his neck, dropping him to the concrete. It's down to Frank and Ferrenti. The two move fast, firing into the shadows as arrows whiz past them. Frank runs to the semi-truck, tossing Ferenti as lighter as he stuffs a wad of cloth into the gas tank. He pulls himself up into the cab, calling for the prisoner to light it up as he starts the engine. In the distance, the fire goblins pause as they see two globes of light piercing the tunnel. The semi plows through them, squishing the hot goblin blood from their veins as it squishes them under the tires. Frank barrels forward, throwing aside the creatures as he pushes for the exit. At the last second, he jumps clear, smashing the windshield of a car as he rolls to safety. The semi tips over and the air is suddenly filled with fire as the wind pushes against him. The explosion echoes through the tunnel behind him. Outside, the goblins are at full retreat, running and screaming from the tunnel. Frank and Ferenti come running out, weapons at the ready! And they find an almost calm city night. Come out! Ferenti calls over his shoulder. The hospital evacuees come out, finally breathing fresh air again. I can't believe you two did it. The doctor smiles, and she thanks them both, shaking Frank's hand. You don't have to thank me. Keep your people safe and get them to shelter, Frank grunts. Frank and Ferenti lean against a cop car for a few seconds until the Punisher finally turns and begins to rummage through it. Earlier today, I saw a monster crush a car. Killed a wife and kid. Father survived. He pulls out a shotgun slung under the dashboard and pops the trunk. I swore to the man that I'd find and kill the monster that took everything from him. In the trunk, he finds a med kit and some shells. Ferenti watches as the hospital patients begin to move away, with the sun coming up over the horizon. What do you want me to do, he asks. Frank grabs him from behind, bringing a pistol up into his back, and he pulls the trigger. Ferenti turns, shock on his face as his life bleeds out of his chest. The Punisher stares as he falls. The doctor comes back over sandwiches that she found in her hands. Shock subtly fills her face as she rushes to Ferenti's aid. How could you? She questions as he starts to try and administer CPR, but Frank reaches down for one of the discarded sandwiches. How could I not? He asks. He leans back, taking a bite as he watches the woman begin to pump the man's chest. I don't miss. She turns, tears in her eyes. You promised on your family's souls! Frank merely wipes the crumbs from his chin. You ever patch up a soul, Doc? You ever order a soul transfusion? Frank tosses the wrapper away. He needed the prisoners compliant until they got out of the tunnel. He loads the shotgun. I have a soul. This man has a soul. And I even believe you have a soul. She cries. Frank stares down at her. Had. She still cries. Sad that the man died even after they helped them escape from the war. Frank turns, loaded for the fight ahead. No, doctor. The war never ends. The frost giants look up into the dark, icy night air of Jotunheim as a purple mist streaks through the sky. The mist swirls, finally landing, and as that magic dissipates, the mist drifting away reveals Meliketh the Accursed. I smell elf. A voice hisses from the darkness, every word the sound of flames cracking over the roaring fire. Now why, after so many centuries of slumber, do I smell elf? A wide grin spreads over Meliketh's evil features as he stops before the dark cave entrance. It's Meliketh, Sadarang, conqueror of the Nine Realms. If I remember mortal manners, should you not be kneeling? The Dark Elf journeys deeper into the cave, greeted by the massive jaws of Sodorang. He wishes to implore the ancient dragon for a boon, for his aid in this war. Only one realm still remains free of the Dark Elves' grasp, and he would wish that Sodorang would take care of a single man for him. If this boil is so aggressively insignificant, why don't you lance it yourself? The dragon asks. He's clad in iron. Meliketh explains simply. Yet Sodorang merely chuckles at the elf's plight, for iron is the ancient weakness of the Dark Elves. Finally, Meliketh bows before the mighty beast. He has gold, mountains of it. The dragon's great eye finally flickers open as he peers into the dim light of the cave. Gold, you say? Very well, I shall see him crisped. The mighty dragon runs his claws around the bed of treasure that he sits upon before hearing back. Where is the golden knight you speak of? Earth, within the bowels of the forge in Stark Unlimited. Tony, what am I looking at? Rhodey asks as he stares at a massive green bot that Tony's drones keep flying around. Hulkbot? Gamma Droid? I'm still trying to think of a name that won't get me pummeled next time I see the real thing. Tony explains with a smirk. 
Brody just shakes his head. He knows what it is, but doesn't understand its purpose. Tony walks through the lab as his drones finish the final details on the bot, and he pulls the golden crown off of the Hulk bot trying to explain. I built this for Bruce, so that when he starts to rage, when his power starts to come out, it'll calm him. The crown is designed to control one's emotions. Are you sure you built this for Bruce, Tony? Brody asks, staring at his friend. The billionaire pauses for a single beat. Does it matter? The two friends begin to discuss the merits of the bot and of Tony's drones building more robots, but Tony thinks Rhodey should just lighten up. Suddenly, the Hulk bot comes to life, smashing everything around them. What am I? What am I? It screams as its massive fists tear apart everything around its existential rage. Shut it down, Tony screams, but the bot is suddenly overriding its own safety protocols and the drones can't shut it down. Bring me a gauntlet, he yells at one of the drones and the little bot floats off quickly. The Hulk bot wraps its massive hands around Tony, ripping him from the ground. Luckily, the drone is there placing Tony's Iron Man gauntlet on his hand. The beam shoots out, destroying the Hulkbot's head, dropping it to the ground. The two friends pulled themselves free of the rubble around them, with Rhodey pointing out that that is why tech building tech is a bad idea. He's also worried that Tony is holding a crown that modifies behavior and won't put it down. Tony looks down at the piece of tech in his hands, and Rhodey knows that he had a drink in the virtual world during the Escape adventure. The videos you can find down below in the Tony Stark playlist. The one that he was trapped in and is looking for more dangerous fixes since he got back out into his own cloned body. Downstairs in the lobby, the security hologram activates asking for the name and purpose of the visitor who strolls in. A staff with a flaming tip in his hands. I am Sorang, devourer of the flocks, lord of the winded sky, and I am here to see your master. The ancient dragon, now in a human form, simply states, I am afraid that Mr. Stark has left for the day, Mr. Flox. The hologram answers with a beaming smile. But Sodorang merely shrugs off the issue, asking where the man keeps his gold. One of the security guards comes walking over, telling the strange man to leave, but Sodorang lifts the man off his feet, choking him. I ask again, where does he keep his gold? He growls, his eyes flashing. I, I don't know, maybe Wall Street? The guard chokes out his answer. Meanwhile, Tony is flying across the city skyline in his car. Knowing that his friend is right, he needs someone to talk to, but Janet Van Dyne, his current girlfriend, doesn't answer her phone and it goes right to voicemail. Janet, it's me. I'm kind of having a rough day. Call me. He tells you before hanging up. The rest of the guards come rushing out with the guns trained on the strange man. Draw to your knees and put your hands over your head or we'll open fire, one of them yells. Soderang peers around at the weapons trained at him. My knees? How dare you? He growls, suddenly his body twisting and warping from the man to become the mighty dragon before them. Soderang bows for no man nor god. You wish my forbearance? You shall have none of it, nor my mercy. The dragon looms back, taking in a massive breath before roasting the guards in a blast of scolding fire. Rhodey runs into the security room, asking what the heck is going on to Bethany, the head of security. Three casualties so far, no Jocasta, no Stark on premises. She tells him as she orders the security details to back off of the dragon. Rhodey stares at the images on the cameras, finally turning to leave the room. He plans on fighting fire with fire and myth with myth. Is anyone gonna armor up? The head of security asks. The cat turns. Dr. Shapiro, reporting for duty, suit me up. Meanwhile, the dragon is crawling alongside the outside of the building, crying for House Stark. Bethany comes over, asking why the drones are defending the building. One of the tech points at their screen, and the computers run the drones, and the computers all suddenly speak Latin. The building groans and crumbles as Sodorang smashes it with his fist. I will burn your stronghold, Stark! Face me, you coward! Quit yelling, you old school guys, you freak! Rhodey yells as he zooms in with his manticore vehicle, firing weapons at the mighty dragon. The missiles impact Sodorang's head, stunning the creature briefly, yet he swoops his wing like a blade, knocking Rhodey out of the sky. The manticore crashes into the ground with Sodorang quickly following. May you gods find you unrecognizable for your journey to Valhalla. He cries as he swings in for the attack, but he's blasted out of the sky as Dr. Shapiro suddenly jumps into the battle in his cat armor. The cat fires, but Sodorang merely shrugs off the assault, breathing magic fire into the cat's armor. The heat pushes Dr. Shapiro back as the dragon presses his attack and suddenly he stops as a voice rings out behind him. Hey, Falcor! Hands off the pussycat! Tony yells as he roars in with his armor, punching the dragon in the side of the head. The blow knocks Sodorang across the courtyard, causing the ground to shake as he tumbles. You're trespassing, Toothless. There's a hefty fine for that. He jokes as he slams the beast with another blow, adding strength to his armor, knocking Sodorang around. The dragon swings its wing, knocking Tony away again. I will have your castle in your corpse! 
Tony struggles back to his feet as the dragon rushes forward, ready to die, mortal. Pass! Never repeat a good trick. I plan to kick your scaly rear like I did Fang Fang Foom a week ago. Tony mutters as he gets back to his feet, hearing those words. Soldering suddenly stops short. Hold! You defeated a Foom? He asks, disbelief in his voice. He turns, seeing Tony's allies coming to his aid. I underestimated you, mortal, but I will return with the proper spells and leave you with the curse of wisdom. He breathes before taking to the air, flying away. Oh, and I didn't get you anything, Tony says as he watches the dragon fly away. The group finally arrives with Rhodey asking if he plans on following the villain. Let's kennel the lizard, Tony states, preparing to give chase. But he suddenly can't, and everyone is surprised as his armor suddenly begins to glow with magical energy. Later, Sodorang stands at the street corner in his human disguise once again, his eyes watching Wall Street. He walks up to the building, stopped by an armed guard. Hold on a minute, sir. Can I help you? Sodorang rears back, fire starting to break out of his hair and hands. Tell your masters that I am here for my 30 trillion dollars. Hurry, morsel, before I get hungry. Back at Stark Unlimited, the group is staring at Tony's armor. Cracks have begun to form and strange magical energy is leaking out. Bethany tries to help her boss, telling him that they think that the dragon infected the AI with magic, which is directly linked to my armor. Tony finishes for her. He looks at his instruments and his entire hut is glowing purple, filled with arcane symbols. Believe it or not, it's actually worse than the inside, he jokes. Suddenly, everyone stares in wonder as the armor begins to shift and morph. Oh, for the love of Dumbledore! Tony cusses as he's suddenly standing in medieval armor, his repulsors glowing with arcane symbols. Rody keeps looking at his friend. Tony, we gotta track Sodorang. Can you still function? Stark shifts, trying to get a feel for how the armor has changed. Magic is just a system, right? It has to have coding. So he turns, raising his gauntlet, trying to shoot a repulsor beam. The air sizzles around them, and suddenly frogs are raining from the sky. I think you missed a line of the program, Stark, Bethany says as she brushes frogs out of her hair. It's raining frogs, Rhodey points out. I could see that, thank you, Team Obvious. Tony lifts the visor on his armor as Rhodey tells him that he should stay behind. If he can't control his wardrobe, he's nothing more than a liability. But Tony turns to see the EMTs picking up one of the falling guards from Soderang's attack. No, Hex or Tech, I'm caging that beast for good, he says. The visor snaps closed and Tony lifts into the air on a magical current. Energy wings sprout out of his back as he swoops into the air. He tries to call his girlfriend Janet again, but he gets her voicemail again. Janet, sweetie, I could really use your moral compass right now, he says as he flies to the city. But within Wall Street, the brokers all stare in confusion as the screens suddenly flicker and change. Strange words and Latin phrases begin to play across them. Suddenly, the building quakes as the mighty soldering crashes to the wall. I've come from the frozen caves to take the king's gold, and I will burn every living thing until I may slumber atop it. Every coin and crystal. He bellows as the brokers all run screaming from the danger. Outside, Tony sees the destruction of running people landing quickly to face the dragon. The building is dark before him. Um, Illuminatus Gigantus, he asks the armor. And suddenly, the center light of his chest beams brighter, illuminating his way. Okay, there's no way that that should have worked. He rushes forward to the building in his armor. Hey, Falcor! He cries, bringing Sodorang's attention around him. He leaps forward, screaming the one magic word that he knows. Shazam! And bolts of magical energy fall from the sky, striking the dragon in a dozen spots. The beast falls, momentarily stunned. So you're a wizard as well, Stark. He hisses, but a toss of his wing knocks Tony across the room, smashing him into a wall. Massive claws wrap around Tony, bringing him down to the ground. I know what you're thinking, Stark. You're thinking of the women you have betrayed and oaths you have broken. The claw smashes Tony back into the wall, cracking the concrete with force. A drunkard as well! A vow to abstain yet to have besotted yourself at the first possible opportunity. And the great Meliketh told me to fear you. Tony's hands begin to glow with energy again, and he raises them. You're not wrong, Sodorang. I do keep messing up, but I'm trying to do better, and my hands are free, puffin' stuff. The dragon begins to choke as his throat is suddenly filled with frogs. He reels back, releasing Tony, allowing him to fly away. Tony zips through the city, the bellows of Sodorang's curse fast behind him. He gets over the radio, telling Rody to be ready. His friend is confused. Ready for what? Stop! Stop the repairs! We need to take Stark Unlimited back to the Stone Age. He tells his friend. He patches through to Bethany, telling her to pull the plug and everything in the office. Go dark! Do you hear me? Go dark! Stark, I come for your flesh and soul! The dragon roars as he swoops through the city, his wings clipping the buildings as he passes. Tony lands next to Rhodey, ordering his friend to run before turning to the Hulkbot. Hulkbot, I need you to tear this armor off me without hurting the nice man who invented you. He tells the drone. So the Hulkbot gets to work with Tony explaining that he needs to go low tech. The dragon is a magical virus. Just like a bug. 
Janet smiles as she flies in. Got your message. Brought your compass. She tells her boyfriend. Tony hugs her and then looks up at the incoming dragon. I'm gonna need about four and a half minutes, he tells her. Wasp nods, giving Tony a kiss before swooping into the sky to meet Soderang in the fight. Tony doesn't hesitate. He runs towards Stark Unlimited. The wasp flies in and out around Soderang's head. What a matter of fairy folk dares put yourself between the fire and the beast? He questions, but Janet smiles. You're so large and powerful, surely a tiny thing like me can't stop you. But Janet shoots one of her energy blasts into his eye, bringing forth a roar of pain. He makes a bite at her, but the hero is between his teeth and moves away quickly. Soderang flops to the ground, shooting forth a gust of breath to try and burn her. Why did you defend him, consort? You know his weakness, he bellows, and Janet keeps on the move as she knows that everyone has a weakness. Soderang, let's pretend I pulled the sword from the stone, shall we? A voice calls out, causing the dragon to turn. Tony stands before him in the original armor, built to withstand anti-aircraft guns and rip apart tanks. Low tech, no AI. Tony comes in swinging, his fist connecting with the dragon's head, and he presses the attack, leaping up and cracking Sodorong in the chest. The beast breathes fire, but it doesn't phase the Mark I, and Tony pounds him back into the ground. Blow after blow, the dragon's teeth start to chip and crack, and suddenly Janet is there, pulling Tony off the almighty Sodorong. He's down, he's out cold, she tells him, trying to calm him down. With the danger over, the two quickly hug, with Tony struggling to tell her what happened to him in the virtual world. But they're interrupted as Bethany comes running over. She's getting a message from the Avengers. Something is happening in New York. You wouldn't happen to have an elf buster armor, would you? Tony looks at her. This day just keeps getting better and better. The ruins of the once beautiful capital of the light elf realm crumbles around them, with the survivors moving amongst the ruins, with Sir Ivory Honeyshot trying to guard his queen. Sir Ivory, the queen says, turning at the energy that she senses. Get behind me, my queen, he orders, drawing his twin pistols. Yet she shakes her head, drawing her blade instead, ready to stand in defense of her people. Dark energy surges and a man steps through. Hold your fire. I'm no damn elf, Frank Castle growls. He stares down at the barrel of Honeyshot's pistol. He doesn't have time for this. Thor's mom sent me. He looks around at the small group of survivors, broken and defeated. He knows that they've lost everything at this war with Meliketh. You want payback? Follow me. I'll lead you right to the war. On the remains of Asgard, the defenders of the Bifrost have failed. Amongst the destruction that was the Rainbow Bridge, Daredevil fights alongside Jane Foster and Heimdall to defeat the remaining Dark Elves. When finally the last elf falls. Apologies, Heimdall. I've proven a poor guardian of the Rainbow Bridge. Daredevil states, his shoulders slumping. No worse than I, Lord Daredevil, the god states, knowing that the most important thing is that the strike teams have been dispatched. Yet Jane worries, because now there is no way to bring them home with the Rainbow Bridge destroyed. Over on Svlatelheim, Lady Freya stands over the fallen Bitterhand, the former guardian of Melika's Black Bifrost, the energies of the Black Gate Sword swirling around her. I have seen the last blackened breath of life withering in your lungs, bitter hand. She growls her words like living shadows. Her eyes glow with the power of the gate, and she sees every black horror throughout the Ten Realms, every wicked act of this diseased war. I see more Dark Elves dying here today. She turns as She-Hulk continues to fight the advancing elves, ordering her to leave with the rest of the team. Hulk not leave she got alone! She cries, her fist finding another skull. Freya dances amongst the elves, her dark blade biting through their flesh. She knows that the She-Hulk will not abandon her, and so she uses her new powers to send dark tendrils wrapping around the Hulk body, pulling her through the black Bifrost. Do me a favor and tell my son that his mother loved him like lightning loves thunder. The Dark Elves advance, seeing now that there is merely only one fighter. How many Dark Elves do you think that one goddess is worth? She asks, magic in her eyes. Hundreds, thousands, all of you! Keep coming until you have an answer! In the Dark Realm, the Elves advance. Freya has sent her strike team to gather allies for war, with She-Hulk arriving in the realms of the dwarves, bringing tears to their eyes with her motivational speech. Blade traveled to Vanaheim, gathering the reclusive Vanir gods, leading them to the portal. Ghost Rider travels to the realm of the dead in his hell charger, leading a pack of giant angry spiders behind him. Just when I thought my life couldn't get more metal! Over on Jotunheim, Captain America and his strike team have found Thor, dragging his wounded body back through the swirling gate to Midgard. 
The team makes its way back to Avengers Mountain, yet the inside of the dead celestial is deserted. Outside, T'Challa is fighting alongside Thori, and the pair leap over the celestial's fingers as they do battle with the fire goblins. The frost giants scale the base, hoping to bring it down from above. But inside, Shuri stands before a massive computer system, preparing the base's defenses. The Black Panther orders her to open fire. And outside, energy beams erupt from the Celestial, turning the armies of Meliketh to ash. Captain America turns to his team, ordering them to get Thor to the infirmary. Before he can figure out the status of the other teams, though, he is interrupted by the bellows of anger from the hall. Where is she? Where in the bloody hell is my wife? Blood dripping from Odin, the God King's body as he glares angrily with his one good eye. Freya is fighting on back at the Black Bifrost though, with the bodies of fallen elves creating a mountain beneath her as the dark energy is swirling around her. But meanwhile, across the world, the War Avengers are fighting for it. The forces of Midgard are doing their best to defend their lands as fighter jets scorch past the Statue of Liberty with missiles firing at the Frost Giants. Elsewhere, Meliketh looks into the sky, smiling. All of Midgard is at war, all thanks to me. You're welcome. He grins, turning back to his prisoner, the symbiote known as Venom. The creature's form shifts as he tries to elude Meliketh's magic, yet it is held fast. Pain sears through its body as the Dark Elf hits it with even more magic. Meliketh knows that the symbiote is merely a weapon, meant to kill gods. He laughs. Bitter hand! Send me some more wine wenches while I tame this beast. His smile drops briefly as he looks up and receives no answer. Bitter hand? Odin, meanwhile, can barely stand, yet his voice is strong as he looks at the heroes of Midgard. Tell me this isn't true. Tell me my wife was not left alone in the very home of the Dark Elves. He growls, Frank Castle stepping forward. It was her mission, her orders, he tells him. But Captain America doesn't believe that she has lost. They can still go through the open portal and bring her back through. But Odin knows that they cannot pass through the portal if Freya does not want them to. Cap refuses to accept that. There has to be a way. I said a lot of you couldn't, Odin explains, turning back to the heroes with murder in his eyes. But none of you are the All of Father. Someone bring me my spear. I've got something better than a spear, Tony Stark states as he walks into the room, Screwbeard the dwarf at his sign. Some of us built you an early Father's Day gift. Screwbeard did all the work. Human mostly talk about self, the dwarf adds. Enough talk, Stark. Whatever the hell this is, it better be good at slaying elves, the Allfather states. Freya, meanwhile, is screaming as she swings her blade, felling the final Dark Elf for the moment. The bodies of the Fallen lay beneath her and the armies of Meliketh prepare for another assault. She can sense it, though. The success of the strike teams and the return to Midgard. There's only one thing left to do, she says, turning her attention to the dark gate behind her. Destroy the Black Bifrost and end this. Raising her weapon, the Queen of the Gods prepares to strike when suddenly a dark blade slides through the portal, stabbing her in the chest. Did you really think it would be that easy? Meliketh asks as he steps through. You might hold that sword, but this is still my realm, he says with a sneer. Freya tries to stand to swing her sword into Meliketh, but the blade that pierces her is the weapon of a symbiote. It morphs, it shifts, it's slashing her over and over. Meliketh turns away bored and he orders his men to feed her to the dogs. Dark elves of Svetelheim! A voice booms from the black Bifrost. Get the hell away from my wife! Odin bellows now clad in the new armor given to him by Tony Stark. Energy blasts come out of the gauntlets, cutting through the gathered elves. With Freya struggling to stand, the symbiote still piercing her, Odin orders her to leave, yet she will not. We are taking away Meliketh's greatest weapon, his black Bifrost, she states firmly, despite her wounds. I was afraid you'd say that. The two gods stand back to back, energy blast punctuating every slash of Freya's blade. I'll see you in hell, Freya, and kiss you like you've never been kissed before. Odin cries to his wife. She then brings down her weapon with all of her power, splitting the stones of the black Bifrost. Meliketh turns, his weapon reforming in his hands as fear and anger play across his face. Stop them! Stop them! Don't let them destroy the Bifrost! He orders. The stones crack as Freya drives her weapon deep, with Odin's energy blast covering her, doing as much damage as they can. When finally, the world crumbles around them and the two gods embrace. Freya pulls her husband in close as the dark energy begins to leave her. 
forget hell. Kiss me now, you fool, she tells him. And with that, the Black Gate explodes. Back on Midgard, Frank Castle stands in the Avengers armory with a detachment of Light Elves. We want all of these that you can carry. The bigger, the better, he tells them, sweeping his arms to indicate all the guns on the wall. Stand aside, please. A voice struggles from behind them. Of course, my lord, the elves answer, stepping aside and bowing as Thor jumps into the room. Sorry about your family, Frank tells him, and for a brief moment, an almost human emotion reflects in his eyes. Thor reaches out, grasping the arm of the Destroyer. In the war room, Jane Foster stands on the table, laying out the battle plan. They are sick of this war, sick of these invaders. Jane offers that they should take the fight to them. With the Avengers in the lead, she starts, but is interrupted by a voice that now vibrates with strength. Nay, there is only one who will lead this fight, and his name is Thor, God of Thunder. He states as he enters the room, now fully armed. Across Midgard, the rumble thunders. The hard and angry rain begins to fall, and soon will come the lightning and the hammers will follow. Meanwhile, back with Daredevil, his eyes glow with his guardian magic. Once he could hear every scream within New York City, now armed with the sword of the power of Heimdall, he can hear every scream in existence. Most of the seven billion people on Earth are screaming right now as the war rages on. Then we shouldn't be wasting any time. We need to get back to Midgard. Why did you drag me out here, Daredevil? Thor asks, pacing across the deck of the longboat as the sun crackles behind them. Daredevil looks over his shoulder at Thor, telling him that the screams of the people of Earth aren't the ones that they need to listen to. They aren't the ones that will end this war. There's another scream right here. Can't you hear it? He asks. Thor turns to answer, but is shocked as the longboat drifts towards the ancient tree that springs in the sun as if by magic. Yggdrasil. The World Tree, a seedling that was growing on Asgardia when it was cast into the sun, it now grows. You seek an answer, God of Thunder. Some answers demand a price. Daredevil intones quietly. Thor joins the man without fear at the railing of the longboat, staring up, waiting for the answers on how to win this war. Finally, he hands off his axe. Take my axe, devil, but be prepared to hurl it with all your might and nail me to that tree. He orders him before slinging his hammer and flying into the sky. He asks only one more thing of his comrade. Ignore my screams. Meanwhile, over at Wakanda Midgard, the warriors of Wakanda fight as the armies of heaven descend upon them. Damn these fleas! When will they learn to gravel before their queen? The queen of heaven curses as she watches her warriors dying. But Okoya stands before her, and the warriors Sif, Hildegard, and Angela at her back. There's no word for grovel in our language, yet there are 23 for fight, and you will learn them all. Welcome to Wakanda, she states as she drops into the battle stance. She leaps from the Asgardian long ship spear first, launching towards the Queen of Heaven. Black Panther flies by in a Pegasus, clipping the wings of the angels as he broadcasts orders over the battlefield. Below them, Frank Castle looks up, a squad of heavily armed light elves with him. Don't aim for the wings. They can still fight without those but they can't do much without a head. Yet the Light Elves have been at war, and they have no need for lessons in how to make war, and they open fire. Above them, the lightning crackles in its sparks, bringing down the energy of the heavens, with storms lashing out across the world, aiding the great battle. And over on the coast of Uruguay, the lightning strikes, blasting away the risen dead. Enchantress stands, bored as her zombies pile atop the Ghost Rider, but his hellfire burns brighter, and he throws them away. Nearby, Doctor Strange and Balder lash out of the zombies while driving in the Hell Charger of Ghost Rider. Spider-Man swings into battle, leading his new army of Hell Spiders, who follow their new leader with glee. In Australia, Yulik the Troll staggers as another blow from the Hulk and her mighty hammer cracks him across the jaw. Now this is my idea of a Lady Thor, he crows. When I'm done conquering this beautiful and barren land, you will be my queen. Thunder Hulk no lady, stinking troll no king. The battle rages and Luke Cage, Iron Fist, Deadpool, and Daredevil fight amongst the trolls. And over in Antarctica, the war rages. Communications are restored as Roxxon is stopped. The Minotaur, Dario Agar, is brought down by Roz Solomon and Jane Foster with the two women piercing his chest with vibranium bullets in the Spear of Odin. Later on Asgard, Jane Foster lands, and before her stands Heimdall. Even here, they can both hear the screams. It's Thor, isn't it, she asks. He's searching for answers inside of the sun, a way to beat Meliketh's challenge and defeat him. Heimdall turns, his all-seeing eyes following Jane as she crosses the field, knowing what she plans to do. Please do not do anything rash that would risk the health that you have fought so hard to regain. But Jane knows who fought hard. Brunhilde and the other Valkyries, all of those that have given their lives to this war. 
She stares down at the shattered remains of the hammer of the war Thor, the Thor from the dead multiverse. Meanwhile, over in Shanghai, Captain Marvel is fighting goblins in the sky while the other heroes fight in the streets. Welcome to the Warriors 3, Sir Wolverine! Hogan cries, turning to Logan as he lets out a scream of berserker rage, driving his claws through another goblin. Can we keep him? Fendrel asks. In Manhattan, Iron Man fights through the skies with his new squad of war machine doors at his back while the Fantastic Four do their part in the streets. In London, it's Captain America and Captain Britain fighting side by side. As the War of the Realms rages across Midgard and Melikath's Great War Machine shudders, there's a great storm brewing above the skies of every battlefield and great cracks of lightning lash out from the heavens, aiding the heroes of Midgard. Thor is suddenly there, all lightning, blood, and Uru. He bellows and his words are like thunder. Melikath! Where is that bastard hiding? It was then that Meliketh gave forth his challenge, the symbiote curling around him as he issues his challenge to Thor, standing amongst the great Stonehenge. Only Thor can pass through the magical barrier that Meliketh has raised at Stonehenge. Odin cries out, trying to warn his son, but his words turn to pain as the dark elf lashes out with his symbiote. Do hurry, Thor. I swear I will write the last chapter of this war with you. It was this challenge that forced Thor to nail himself to the world tree, to seek a way to defeat Meliketh's challenge. The searing heat of the sun licks at his body. There must be a way! Thor mumbles before another scream of pain racks his body. But back on Asgard, Jane Foster reaches down for the shattered remains of the hammer of the war Thor. Because there must always be a Thor. Sometimes, there must be more than one, she says quietly as lightning crackles around her, and she screams as the power fills her. In Asgard, at the far end of time, the three daughters of King Thor continue to read from an ancient book, when suddenly they stop. Wait, it says that Thor's allies travel to the far future. You don't think that means? That's when the room is suddenly split by a glowing beam of light. Hey there, young ladies. Don't suppose you could point us to? Ben Grimm asks as he sticks his head through the time portal. Yet his words are interrupted as King Thor stalks into the chamber, clad in his armor, armed for war. I am here, he growls, staring at the faces that he has not seen in a long time. I've been waiting for this day for a millennia. All Father Thor is ready for war. Back in the present day, Thor sits among the ruins of Asgard, his body covered in burns, his lost eye covered. The challenge would seem impossible, yet Yggdrasil has given him the answer. If only Thor can save the day, then we simply need more Thors. He says, turning to all Father Thor from the future. The old man nods gruffly. By my beard, it worked once before. He responds, looking at the younger self with one good eye. The years have not been kind to you, boy. You look like hell. You look like me. Are any of you one-eyed geezers going to compare my ladies all morning, or is there an actual war to be fought here? Young Thor asks, entering the chamber with his axe over his shoulder. The god of Vikings did not come all this way to Yammer. The oldest Thor stands, turning to his younger self. Ah, splendid! You brought the arrogant, unworthy one. Ah, Father Thor nods. What? Was the frog not available? The younger Thor smiles at his future. At least I've still got all my body parts, you half-crippled old troll fart. Yet Thor knows that they will need them all. There is power in this trinity of Thors, and they need all of their fists for this fight, whether they hold a hammer or not. I, my fists and hammer agree, Lady Thor states, as she comes strolling into the room, the hammer of War Thor in her hands. Great! Everyone has a hammer but me, young Thor sighs. Thor questions how Jane is even standing there as Thor, and she looks at him, explaining that the hammer of War Thor is trying to tear itself apart even now. We should move quickly, Thor, she tells him. Thor nods, so they shall. The war party of Thors shall move with all the rage and howling wrath of a storm. A storm for the Odin damned ages. The thunder sounds across the realms as the Thors fly across the air, lightning flashing like stars exploding. Rain falling from the fury of Amherst. Every eye lifts to the skies of fear and wonder to behold the coming storm of Thors. The battle wages across Midgard over the streets of New York City with Iron Man and Human Torch cutting through the frost giants as Frank Castle's voice directs the heroes over their comms. Frank, you are so in your element. It is adorable. Tony smirks over the radio. Frank doesn't even pause as he continues to fire his weapon at his enemies moving alongside his elven squad. War is war. 
Giants just take more bullets is all. He says before ordering his fighters to keep sweeping the streets. Captain America and Black Panther stand before the mighty Lofry, King of the Frost Giants. Dan down, Lofry. Your fight is lost, Cap orders. The Queen of the Angels is dead. Amara and Ulick are in chains. Your allies are falling, Black Panther adds, but the King of the Giants merely smiles. Lawfrey never had allies, the giant tells them holding up a casket in his massive hands. The king throws the casket into his mouth, with his eyes suddenly beginning to glow. The great giant takes a massive breath, suddenly blowing a mighty blizzard through the streets of New York, throwing the heroes away, all except one. Daredevil, the god without fear, pushes through the blast of icy wind, the sword of Heimdall clutched in his hands. Have at thee, son of Jotunheim! He cries, leaping forward for Hell's Kitchen! The sky's alight with lightning and thunder echoing across Stonehenge as Melikent looks up, his forces surrounding him. Do you hear that rumble? He's coming, he says to the Dark Elves, covered in the dark tendrils of the Venom Symbiote. Your war is lost, Melikent. Run for your wretched life while you can. Freya spits from her chains. Yet the Dark Elf merely turns, tendrils of the symbiote snaking over his face as his mouth turns into a malicious smile. The War of the Realms is such a thing of grisly beauty. Without a doubt, one of my proudest, most murderous moments. He grins, but killing Thor in front of his parents. <laughs> that will be my bloody masterpiece. Beaten and bloodied, Freya turns as much as she can to her husband hanging beside her. Tell me, husband, who do the gods pray to in times like this? She asks. Though beaten, Odin's voice is strong. Pray to Thor if you like, wife. Although something tells me he won't hear you over the thunder. Lightning suddenly cracks across the ground, and the mighty Thors are amongst their enemies. Malekith! I've come for my parents! Thor bellows. And for your head! Jane adds. Her own words the sound of booming thunder. Yet Meliketh laughs. He has more than Dark Elves at his side now. Venom has been engorged by his magics. Black wings spread from his back as his own forces twitch amongst the dark tendrils. You may call me the Butcher of Thors! He cackles before turning to his men. Kill the parents! The Thunderers belong to me. The Thors do not hesitate, throwing their hammers, calling their foes. Parents, Jane states. Spider Elves! All Father Thor growls. Melikath, Thor nods. Great, I guess I'll get the dogs, young Thor pouts. Back in New York, though, Daredevil leaps, throwing his sword at Lofry as the blood turns to slush in his veins from the Frost Giant's attack. The sword bounces across his eyes, finally landing on his throat. Was that supposed to hurt? The King of the Giants laughs as he swallows the blade whole. Your sword is nothing more than a snack for the mighty Lofry. The Frost Giant peers down at Daredevil, who now stands with nothing more than his fists. The giant takes another deep breath and begins to blow the blizzard that would turn Midgard into a barren wasteland of ice. Yet suddenly, all of Earth can hear the storm. It explodes from the very sun itself, and the star becomes an eye. A storm unparalleled, with winds that would raise a world. A storm to end all of time, or save it. By the gods, how could you be this slow? Young Thor laughs as his axe cleaves another of the Hellhound's heads from its body. But all Father Thor keeps swinging his hammer, the Uru connected with another dark elf symbiote. How can you be so reckless? Watch your back, boy. If you get your full self killed, we all die. At what age did I become my father? Elsewhere, Lady Jade is fighting her way to the king and queen of the gods, bellowing her rage. Above them, Thor and Meliketh fight. The axe Yonborn swinging and taking a chunk out of the Dark Elf. Thor tries to follow up with a swing with his hammer, but the symbiote lashes out, throwing him to the earth. Remember when I lopped off your arm with your own axe? Meliketh hisses as his symbiote wraps around Thor's hammer, turning it into a dark mace. I wonder what damage I could do with this. <laughs> Thor reaches his hand out, trying to call upon his hammer, but the weapon doesn't respond, and it is the last hammer in all of Asgard. It is now lost to the enemy. Behold! The Black Hammer of the Accursed! The enemy howls as he launches towards Thor, swinging his new weapon. But Lady Jane is there, her own hammer blocking Meliketh's assault. Nay, we Thors are harder to kill than you can imagine, she cries. But Meliketh's tongue, sharpened by the symbiote, attempts to pierce her. She dodges, she shifts, crying out, Ka! Verily, that is disgusting! 
Meliketh is pushed back as the fist of Thor connects with his hammer. Congratulations, Thor! I see you finally gone mad! <laughs> But Thor merely presses his attack, screaming with rage. Behold, the berserker madness of Thor! He bellows. His fists connect again and again, yet Meliketh knocks him away. I will beat you to death with your own damned hammer! Thor tries to struggle to his feet, but the symbiote wraps around him, holding him down as Meliketh comes in for the final swing. But that's when Thor gets his hand up, and the black tendrils of the hammer pierce his flesh. The energy crackles around Thor, his eyes sparking with lightning. All I need to finish you, Meliketh, is a good, hard rain. Suddenly, the earth is enveloped by a rain of fire. And across the world, the heroes of the realm look up, seeing the storm swirling above their heads. Melika stares upwards, his smile briefly faltering as the flames begin to lick the symbiote. Is that all you've got? In Svetelheim, it rains fire every Thorn's day! He hisses, but Thor smiles. I know your symbiote's weakness. I haven't been wielding the God Tempest this entire time so that I can make it rain. He says, standing to his feet as the venom tendrils shrink away. From the storm comes something, and it hits the earth with an explosion that shakes the very ground around them. The smoke clears, revealing a hammer. The Uru is held by a branch of the World Tree, forming a handle that twists with power. On the metal is burned an inscription known throughout the realms. Whosoever wields this hammer, if they be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. I used it for forging. Hello, old friend. Thor smiles. His friends and family watch stunned as the bodies of their enemies lay around them. By the gods, he did it! Odin gasps. The fires burn around them as Thor walks forward with Meliketh keeping pace. You, you can't pick it up, you're not! But Thor reaches down, the energy cracking off the hammer and into his outstretched hand. What I truly am, Meliketh, now and forevermore. The hammer seems light, as if it never weighed anything at the time. The power of the storm and the fire swirl around him, and in the distance, the thunder rumbles once again. It's the god of the unworthy. Thor swings the hammer in one massive blow, the metal connecting with Meliketh's face, throwing him to the ground, ending the war. Defeated, the symbiote swirls away from the fallen elf, leaving him nothing more than broken on the ground. The hammer does not make the Thor. The Thor makes the hammer. Jane simply stays walking up behind Thor, her own hammer cracking further. Not long for this world. They both stare at it. It should be good for one last hurl. In New York, the blizzard continues to blow as Lofri, the king of the giants, prepares to usher in the new age of giants. And suddenly, he's cracked on the side of the head by a massive hammer, blood gushing as his eyes fall loose. Who threw that? He bellows. Yet his words are cut short as a slice appears in his stomach. Purple blood begins to flow, and the wound erupts as the swirls of an endless winter blows from his open gut. His scream of pain echoes through the city as he falls, and from his stomach stands a blood-soaked Loki the casket of an endless winter in one hand and the sword of the daredevil in the other what's wrong father was it something you ate at Stonehenge Meliketh tries to struggle to his feet raising his black hammer once again his screams lashing out as young Thor takes off his arm with Yarnborn the group of Thors surround him but still he doesn't completely fall you're finished Meliketh your war has ended Thor tells him. No! Belica screams, his voice becoming high-pitched. My armies may be lost, but I am still the lord of the wild hunt! He screams, ordering his dogs to kill the Thors. Thor tries to stop him, telling him that the beast can smell his fear. I have no fear! Meliketh bellows as the animals grow closer. He turns, with the monsters lashing out, their teeth sinking into his body. He screams, but this only drives them into a frenzy. They raise into the sky, tearing his limbs off. The war has ended. The heroes of Midgard cheer in the streets of New York. The hammer does return to Jane, but it begins to dissolve even as it grows closer. She knows it was worth it, worth it to feel the storm one last time. The hammer explodes, showering her with golden light and energy. And when it dissipates, she stands there with a golden arm brace. What the hell just happened? She questions. So, throughout the Ten Realms, the cheers of victory and an end to the war can be heard. Thor looks up into the coming dawn, 
with Mjolnir clasped once again in his hands. Odin stands before his son, stunning him as he falls to his knees. All hail the rightful Lord of Asgard, the savior of realms. All hail, all father Thor. And there you have it, the full story for the War of the Realms is complete. The return of Thor to proper Thor comic books. I hope you guys enjoyed this. We enjoyed doing this. We thought it was a lot of fun to do the tie-in series. But what did you guys think? Did you like all the tie-ins? Would you have rather have us just done one through six? What would have made things easier for you? Let me know in the comments down below. And don't forget to give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want to get more videos just like this. Because every Monday, we do a massive Monday. And every other day of the week, we catch you up on your comic books and video games. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.